Welcome back, everyone, to the second day of the Key Technologies Shaping the Future conference. And a particular welcome to anyone who's joining us for the first time. We had a great day yesterday. Hopefully, we'll have another fantastic session this afternoon. My name is Alok Jha. I'm the science and technology correspondent at The Economist. For the next few hours or so, we'll be, I'll be your host as we examine how engineering technologies right at the cutting edge of research today will frame our society and our economy over the next 30 years. So uh, what you'll find is that we do a lot of polls during this session. So let's kick off with a quick poll to get things started. Uh, this should appear in the box below your screen, and I'll come back to the results after I've run through a few housekeeping notes for those joining us for the first time. Uh, the poll, by the way, just to, just to read it out to you, what is your main reason for attending this event this week? Uh, is it knowledge? Is it networking? Is it to form collaborations? Did your boss make you go? Or uh, do you think you're in the wrong event? In which case, just join us anyway. It's going to be entertaining and wonderful. So the housekeeping notes. Now, for the best viewing experience of this event, we recommend that you go into full screen mode. And you can do that by clicking on the maximize screen icon in the bottom right-hand corner of this video. Uh, to come out of full screen mode, you can click on the same icon. So in the bottom right-hand corner of this video, you've got, uh, you've got a, a button that can maximize the icon. So to pose questions during the panel discussion or during the Q&As, uh, just type your question into the Q&A box uh, on the screen and click on the blue arrow to send. You can also, if you don't want to ask your own question, but you like someone else's question, you can upvote other people's questions uh, so you, they get asked um, and they're more likely to get asked. Now, if you'd like to comment on the conference on social media, which you should, of course, do, please can we ask you to use a hashtag, a hashtag KeyTech21, that's K-E-Y, T-E-C-H 21. So we can get the discussion going there. We can corral everything in one place. Finally, uh, the recordings of all the sessions will be made available to the general public on the Academy and the Cesar websites after the event. Uh, once the recordings have been published, we'll send all of you a link so you can watch them whenever you like. Now then, let's see how the polls are going. The question was, the question for the poll, I'm looking down here on my screen, but the question for the poll was, uh, what is your main reason for attending this event um, this week? Is it knowledge? Is it networking? Is it to form collaborations? Uh, did your boss make you go? Or do you think you're in the wrong event? Let me have a look at the results. Ah, well, 93% of you are here for knowledge, which probably is the right way of thinking about this event. 7% um, for, for networking. Um, no one thinks that uh, they're in the wrong event, which is good. Uh, or to form collaborations. Uh, no one thinks they're here for, to form collaborations, but maybe that's another thing that everyone's here for apart from knowledge. Um, your boss made you 0% uh, too. So good on you all for turning up all by yourselves. Um, now, to start, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Max Liu, President and Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Surrey, Chair of the Cesar Key Technologies Task Force, um, and he will give an overview today and he'll introduce our guest speaker, Professor Rick van der Waal, Rector of Ghent University and President of Cesar. So, Max, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, uh, the day two of the conference, Key Technology Shaping the Future, co-hosted by Cesar, the United Voice of Universities of Science and technology well. in Europe, and also the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, bringing together policymakers, researchers from the United Kingdom and Europe. And this is a great opportunity to imagine what would the world would need by 2050, so that we can develop innovative solutions. I'd like to especially welcome Professor Rick Wanderval, the rector of Ghent University, the president of Cesar, who will be addressing you shortly, and Minister Manuel Hatter, Minister of Science, and Technology and Higher Education in Portugal, who will be delivering this afternoon's keynote speech. And all the distinguished speakers and panelists taking part today. 30 years sounds like a long time away, but if we hope to be prepared and ready for the challenges of the future, we must start now to think ahead what these might be. Today's first theme is net zero world in 30 years. 
So my own research for many years was on energy conversion and storage, although I'm no longer an active researcher running labs or projects. I'm still very passionate about this topic as ever and, and about the clean energy future of ours. So it is encouraging to see the progress being made in this field. So technological breakthroughs as well as behavior and culture change are all needed to tackle this most urgent uh, global challenge. As education and research leaders, we can be proud that our sector has risen to challenge. And for example, with Cambridge and the University of Surrey, both publicly committing to net zero by 2030, we must link our own narratives with clear and practical recommendations for better individual and organizational choices and to help create a pervasive culture of sustainability. And today's second theme is envisioning learning and teaching in 30 years. As I mentioned in my remarks yesterday, the pandemic has highlighted the digital divide in access to education. And this clearly shows that when technology changes the society, it must change it fairly for everyone, or we will simply see new social problems take root. So virtual learning and remote teaching are no longer fringe activities, and the speed of innovation in blended learning will continue to accelerate. Technologies such as augmented and virtual reality, AI, 5G, Internet of Things will help to make the blend of the physical and virtual experiences more seamless. And we need to harness the power of digital technologies to support collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer learning as well. Yet, we should remember that not just technology, but equal access to technology must be the foundation for an equitable, safe, and healthy future. Building Productive, resilient partnerships in research and innovation will be critical to ensuring this outcome. Let us stay optimistic as we work together to shape the future of our world for, for the better. Thank you for your attention. I wish you all enjoy a very, a very fruitful day uh, at this conference. Now, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Rick Vanderval, Director of Ghent University and President of CESAR, to address us. Rick, over to you, please. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and also, of course, for your excellent work in leading the uh, joint task force on key technologies between CESAR and the Royal Academy of Engineering. My gratitude also uh, to our friends in the Academy for hosting this online conference and especially to Sergey McDonald, uh, the current president uh, of your Academy and who happens to be my predecessor actually as president of um, Cesar. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, warm welcome also from me to this second day of our conference on um, key technologies shaping the future. Now, first, allow me a very, very short introduction to our association, which is CESAR. Uh, CESAR started in, back in 1990, and we are basically 53 universities from all over Europe and beyond, united in our conviction around the importance of science and technology. And our world, and the world of universities of science and technology in particular, has, of course, developed tremendously in the last three decades. Let me start by sharing a few thoughts around this rapidly changing um, context. Now, first, times have changed profoundly uh, and humanity and, and even planet Earth face major challenges ranging from the current pandemic to climate change and, 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 and increasing uh, inequality, for example. Now, the knowledge triangle, uh, which is uh, research, education, and innovation, the knowledge trial will play a crucial role in tackling these global challenges, I believe. And universities are key knowledge generators, as we all know, at the core of that uh, knowledge triangle. Now, in addition, 
the globalist uh, world order with, with, as you know, liberal uh, democracies seen as their core is increasingly being challenged um, as well. And from a European perspective, there is an increasing turbulence uh, both inside and outside the EU. And uh, the last few years, uh, an increasingly what you could call introverted United States has weakened, unfortunately, has weakened global institutions and, and links. Now, a new White House uh, administration, the Biden administration, may bring, of course, some balance back, but um, some changes may prove hard to reverse. And the new normal, just, just a few years ago, uh, when we were talking about that a few years ago, we referred to geopolitics under the Trump administration and after the Brexit vote, while the new normal now increasingly refers to to pandemic geopolitics, such as distribution of vaccines and, and the use of vaccination passports. Now, in relation to, uh, to global challenges and, and to changing geopolitical order, universities and researchers are confronted with more expectations, more expectations from various stakeholders. Um, uh, they are, for instance, expected, or we are, for instance, expected to create jobs and to boost economic uh, developments. We are expected to safeguard academic freedom and institutional autonomy. We are expected to assume social responsibility, to contribute to sustainability, to keep knowledge safe and, and control its um, export for national and or international security reasons. Now, resilient universities risk being or also risk being perceived as part of what you could call the exploiting elite and, and serving um, vested interests. So many, many, many uh, challenges um, ahead of us. Uh, and in addition to these complex expectation patterns, the, the, the growth of scientific uh, data and the digitalization have already transformed many aspects of science, technology, learning, and teaching. And in parallel, rapidly um, developing key technologies such as um, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, um, nanotechnologies, life science technologies are adding complexities as developments in science and technology are often outpacing political and societal developments. And an example is in the field of uh, artificial intelligence and facial recognition technologies where there has been a, a, a recent public backlash, actually, where millions of photos had been scraped from social media accounts to help train algorithms, but none of the people in the photos had been asked for permission. And the result is that in these areas, researchers and their universities often find themselves in uncharted terrains and, and nascent and poorly developed guidelines and, uh, and rules. And in response to the, to the changes in these four domains, the societal role of science and technology is evolving rapidly. Moving forward, there are three areas where we as community need to pay special attention. First, to break down barriers, and secondly, to push the frontier, and thirdly, to assume responsibility. And the remainder of my presentation, I will briefly touch upon these. Open global cooperation and competition are vital, are vital to our community as universities of science and technology operate at the very forefront of, first of all, equipping researchers, innovators, learners and teachers with agency. And secondly, in advancing science and technology for great changes and transformations. Open global cooperation and competition are thus foundational for excellence in science and technology, allowing the best to find each other, working together to solve problems, um, complex problems, and to use the best methods and tools that are available. In other words, European research, education, and innovation thrive in global environments and participation of the best from institutions outside the EU. Um, Europe's history has proven that open cooperation and competition are essential to boost excellence, to achieve inclusion, and to bring peace 
and pros uh, prosperity to our society. So yes, we need the best ones within the EU, but we also need the best ones outside the EU. We need to bring together all the, be the best ones on a global, at a global level. Um, and in addition to, um, to breaking down barriers, we must renew our efforts to push the frontier. And in light of our urgent challenges, investigator-driven frontier research, such as research funded by the European Research Council, for example, has come under increasing pressure. And some, of course, are arguing that we must meet urgent challenges by, by redirecting funding away from investigator-driven frontier research towards more politically decided, top-down priorities. But let us be clear, let us be very clear, supporting frontier research is not a luxury. It is a foundational part of tackling complex issues for the simple reason that these issues call for novel ideas and thinking beyond the frontier of our knowledge. Many of our most pressing challenges are pressing precisely because they do not yield the today's to, um, because they do not yield to today's understanding and uh, and tools. Um, my third point is around assuming responsibility. We as universities, we as leaders, we as researchers, we as students, we have a particular responsibility around key technologies and their developments to prevent harm and guide who they will benefit. Ethics and values are vital, and they come from within and cannot be created or enforced from the outside. Now, a key reference document here is the, uh, is the Magna Carta Universitatum, which was already published in 1988 and which has been reviewed uh, in, in 2020. The Magna, Car Magna Carta uh, Universitatum lays down key principles, values, and responsibilities for universities and the academic freedom and institutional autonomy needed for universities to take on their responsibilities. So to summarize uh, this uh, introduction or this talk, let us make sure that we, that we somehow do our homework so that key technologies are for the benefit of humankind and help build forward Europe and our world after the pandemic, to use the words of European Commissioner Maria Gabriel during the uh, European Research and Innovation Days last week. While there is much for us universities to do, we do not, however, operate in a vacuum. There are especially risks which we must avoid, that universities will become somehow instruments in the uh, geopolitical global competition. We are ready and willing to assume responsibility and we invite policymakers and funders in the, in the EU, in the UK, all over Europe and even globally to join us. And in, the context of, um, in this context, I, I congratulate once again the moderators, the speakers, the panelists in the, in the sessions yesterday for their highly, highly inspiring contributions. I thank again our colleagues in the uh, Royal Academy for, for joining forces with us in Caesar in, in organizing this event and I look forward to our session, uh, sessions today where we will explore a, a net zero world in 30 years and envisioning learning and teaching in 30 years with a perspective on, uh, on what we can and should do as of today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to, uh, to day two of the conference Key Technologies shaping the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick and Max. Okay, so let's start today's plenary. And the session is gonna be all about how engineering technology will contribute to net zero world in 30 years. One of the most important challenges I think that engineers have to face. And now, in terms of polls, we've got another short poll coming up to gauge how um, you guys in the audience feel about our chances for a net zero world. So let's get voting. Um, the questions are, by 2050, do you believe Europe, that Europe, including the UK, will A, have, will have reached net zero, which is great, or B, 
Will we be between one and five years away from net zero? C, um, will it be between five and 10 years away from net zero? Or D, are you pessimistic? Will it be more than a decade away from net zero? Now, uh, there are a few, in contrast to many of the areas of discussion, we meet our net zero targets or we don't. Um, but we can ask what investments in technologies and how we integrate technology today that might make it easier to meet targets in 30 years' time. And um, the road to transforming our energy supply seems clear, but what complementary actions do we need to take to create and actually lock in sustainable zero carbon economy? We've been used to fossil fuels for a very long time. What do we need to do to make sure that the 30 years from now, the new, car, the new low carbon, zero carbon economy is sustainable and robust? So, now that I've given you a few seconds to look at the poll, let's look at the results. The question was, by 2050, do you believe that Europe, including the UK, will or will not have reached a net zero? Let me see the polls. So, according to you guys, uh, by 2050, you think that 44% of you think that you'll be between 5 and 10 years away from net zero. Interesting. Um, and 26% of you, will be, you think it's more than a decade away. Um, only 18% only of you think that by in 30 years' time we'll have reached net zero. Now, I'd like to say that those 18% are the most optimistic and uh, the 44% of you that think you're still a decade or so away are being realistic, but somewhere in the middle might be the real answer. And, but it's in interesting to see that most of you think that within 30 or 40 years that net zero is absolutely possible. And perhaps for an engineering-informed audience like you, uh, that's actually quite a useful thing to know for the rest of us, that this is actually going to be possible within the next few decades. So let's get going on the plenary panel. Let me introduce um, our chair for this session, Professor Ravi Silva. Ravi is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and he's also director of the Advanced Technology Institute at the University of Surrey. So uh, Professor Ravi Silva, please take it away. Thank you, Alok, for that uh, introduction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the next 90 minutes, which is going to be packed with data and information on probably one of the most topical and potentially existential threats to the human race, net zero world in 30 years. What is it that needs to be done in order to avoid catastrophic climate change that will have lasting impacts on millions of people? The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, noted to avoid catastrophic consequences, we must restrict any change in temperature to 1.5 degrees by the turn of the century. This means achieving a net carbon zero by 2050. The reductions in greenhouse gases must be swift and significant with energy related reductions in all three major sectors. That includes the domestic residences and buildings, the transportation sector, and the industrial and commerce activities. For those of you who are following world news, you can see the heat wave that is hitting North America at present. This is part of the extreme events that seem to be occurring more frequently in the last decade than any previous time. With present temperature rises close to 1.2 degrees from pre-industrial levels, IPCC have reported net carbon emissions need to decrease by 45% of the 2010 level by 2030. And this means a steady emission of 20 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. This is a distinct challenge, particularly when the world we run currently is powered by coal, oil, and gas. The fossil fuels account for nearly 80% of the energy mix at present and has done so for the last three decades. There is renewed urgency to change this and to meet the requirements of a minimum substitution of one gigaton CO2 per year for the next 10 years in terms of decarbonizing existing energy supply. Furthermore, examining the uses of energy, it would be roughly divided 
to around a third for the domestic and building sector, a third for transportation, and a third for industry and commerce. Decarbonization of energy needs to be across all these sectors if we want to tackle this. And this is what our expert panel will explain to us. Further, even the electricity generation at present worldwide depends on many of the fossil fuels. Therefore, there is much to be done on Earth. The window to act ever decreasing. Since the Paris Accord in December 2015, 196 nations uh, signed the declaration to ensure humanity will pull together to find a solution to avoid, avert the climate change catastrophe. Much like technology-based developments, there are needed to be changes in the way we live. In terms of today's discussions, we will have a first half of our speakers talking about the supply and its uh, distribution activities and how we can go about addressing this problem. And the second half will look more on the demand and making sure that we have system solutions in order to reduce the CO2 emissions or control the CO2 emissions. To explain all of this, this stellar lineup of expert speakers will use examples in everyday engineering systems and the approach we need to put forward to meet a net zero world in 30 years. During the talks, please use Ask the Panel function to direct any questions to the Q&A session so that will follow the first three speakers and then at the end. So to kick things off, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Sir Jim McDonald, who's president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, vice chancellor of the University of Strathclyde, former president of CESA, Sir Jim, with the first minister, uh, co-chairs the Scottish government's energy advisory board. He is chairman of the independent Glasgow Economic Leadership Board. He holds several senior business appointments, including uh, appointments at the Weir Group, the Scottish Power PLC, UK Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and uh, UK National Physical Laboratory. Sir Jim, over to you. Thank you very much, Ravi, and it's a pleasure to be joining all of you today, and uh, particular uh, hello to Rick Van de Waal. It was great to, to hear his introduction as well to the, to the afternoon sessions. So it's my pleasure, first of all, to, to start by giving you some broad overview, which will, I hope, uh, encourage further discussion. So if I go to my, my first slide, please, uh, colleagues in the studio, I'll just keep this moving. Uh, uh, so I, I'll give you a perspective that the Royal Academy of Engineering has been uh, driving for the past few years, uh, and this has been predominantly through our National Engineering Policy Centre, which engages all of the engineering professional institutions across the UK. And the proposition here is, and Ravi touched on it, that for this scale of challenge, for this societal engagement, for this technological challenge, but quite frankly, for this economic opportunity to address this uh, existential issue, uh, we have to take a whole systems approach. Uh, and uh, the UK commitment, which is legally binding, uh, to achieve net zero by 2050 is a massive undertaking. And we're going to need lots of interconnected concurrent action, whether that's from policymakers, investors, indeed the society, because again, it's been touched on at the opening, behavioural activities are key here. Uh, Rick often talked when I was involved with Cesar about STEM becoming STEAM, uh, where we embed uh, humanities and social sciences in the agenda. I think this is key. So we have a big communication issue here, but we also have to allow folk to engage and be respectful of society's role here. So with all of this, we need to look at local and national interventions and, of course, looking at international collaboration, which I will touch on. Next, please. And uh, the, here, here are the key elements that I would uh, point out to uh, in terms of our uh, a proposition about taking a systems approach. There has to be strong and consistent leadership at the structural level in government, and that has to flow through to regulation and financial structures. Uh, without 
uh, unpacking it just now, there's an ongoing debate in the UK that as we try to decarbonise the utilities and power supply and generation, uh, we are not entirely convinced at times that the, the regulator of GEMS incentivisation mechanisms and regulatory frameworks are consistent with achieving net zero by 2050. But they are moving in that direction. But unless we get systems alignment between technology, planning, investment, regulation and policy, then we won't achieve this. And if we look at these other components, understanding the interdependencies of interactions between sectors is key, whether it's electrification uh, or whether it's a, a, in a built environment, uh, we have to see how these play together and that would map out into hydrogen renewables as well as uh, you know, the transport infrastructure. Very importantly, having a common understanding of what's being sought to be achieved. And that's where engineers and technologists uh, we don't just have an opportunity, we have a responsibility to take the evidence, our understanding and the data to inform policy. And that's something that Cesar and the Royal Academy can do even more effectively together. And let's get moving. It's less than 1,500 weeks until we reach the year 2050. We need to start triggering these low regrets options on, on infrastructure, on technology and deployment, and also get to late stage R&D where much of these technologies are de-risked and ready to implement. And of course, having a just transition is key uh, so that we can bring society and our citizens with us. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so here is a, a, a very simple cartoon of work from the Committee on Climate Change, uh, led by a friend of mine, uh, Chris Stark, who used to work with me in the Scottish Energy Advisory Board. And here's a simple vision, but it captures the essence of where we need to get to uh, in the next 30 years. Massive system transformation with energy supply will be predominantly renewables. We need to think through how hydrogen is produced, distributed uh, and utilised industrialization processes are key and CO2 storage, but there are still open debates about where nuclear fits into this. Uh, and that's something that myself and Max have been talking about over the past 24 hours. As we sat in the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, there's still lots to be done, but I think the will is there now to imagine this. And energy use, which Ravi said, will be picked up in the debates, whether it's built environment, transport all the way through to uh, jet zero, as our Prime Minister has talked about, decarbonising air travel and becoming, uh, having a more green maritime solution, uh, all the way through to uh, you know, how we industrialise process. And of course, our natural assets such as land, uh, crops and livestock have to be factored in too. Keep going, please. Next. Uh, and uh, here again, another simplification. I'm an electrical engineer, so here's a model for uh, us moving away from the monolithic, large-scale centralised generation through transmission systems to distribution levels. Now there's going to be a very much more cell of cells mode where we have more autonomous smart grid systems which allow us to deploy low carbon energy and production as well as utilisation right across the network. So uh, there will be, I believe, still a need for a European super grid, but I think we're going to see much more push from the bottom up uh, and the technologies there through advanced sensing, measurement, uh, intelligent systems, power electronics to deploy more autonomous cells. Okay, next uh, slide, please. And a little bit more complicated. Here is a, an example of a systems map, because this is being allowed, allowed the Academy and the National Engineering Policy Centre to bring together key actors, policymakers, technologists, industrialists, uh, those that represent the demand side. And, and here the, the proposition was, what, what does the decarbonisation of homes or the built environment look like? And I'm sure we'll share these slides, uh, uh, Ravi, at the end of the conference, but have a look at this. What it does do is it raises the issue of where the interdependencies are, where the pinch points are, and where there are opportunities to invest quickly so that we get a low regrets intervention that gives us that pathway towards the infrastructure structure that we need for 2050. And of course, the built environment in the, the UK alone, we have around 25 million homes that we're going to have to take on that journey of decarbonisation, which is going to require citizen engagement, behavioural change, as well as advanced technology and systems integration to make this work. Next slide, please. So in, in headline, what is a systems approach? By 2050, we'll need rapid and simultaneous transformations. We've touched on that. And on the right-hand side, you can see the components, whether it's generation and transmission, all the way through to infrastructure, built environment, how we remove uh, greenhouse gases from, from the atmosphere, for example, which implies the opportunity for interest and in research around direct air capture, but going all the way through to supporting decision-making. 
and what are the toolkits that we need to use as engineers and technologists to support the government to make these commitments. And there will be risks. But one thing's for sure, uh, uh, our host talked about how confident we are about reaching 2050. Well, I can guarantee you we'll have zero opportunity to get to 2050 if we don't start moving now. So there's a, a non-probabilistic estimate. So uh, what we need to do is get going now, make these low regrets decisions and try to avoid the risks of unintended consequences. I'll give the, the last run into a few slides just to tease up. Next slide, please. Uh, but uh, cities are a massive opportunity here. Uh, you know, my own city of Glasgow, I'm, I'm proud to say, will be hosting COP26 in November this year, uh, including the Conference of Youth, which will be there as well, which my university uh, expects to be hosting, having lots of exciting, socially progressive, focused young people to feed this debate. And the city of Glasgow has made a commitment to be net zero by 2030. A massive undertaking, but we've just signed a, a Glasgow Sustainability Accord where public, private, academic uh, institutions and the citizens are signing up to take personal and institutional responsibility to accelerate us on this journey. So this is from the macro level to the city level to the citizen level. And again, that systems thinking is what's driving these architectures. Next again, please. And, a, and just a hint of a systems type of project that's emerging rapidly in Scotland. And we have several of these, but I'll, I'll just finish my last couple of slides. This is the Orion project. This is the Shetland Islands, which is world famous for oil and gas. And here we're seeing companies, oil and gas companies, service companies, uh, my own university and many other players taking, uh, you know, around about a gigawatt of power uh, in that area and uh, decarbonizing the platforms doing energy conversion at sea to hydrogen, having low carbon transportation systems and taking it back ashore for either combustion process, transport or other any conversion. And we're looking here at, at, at billions of pounds worth of investment, but the industry has made a commitment. The policymakers are supporting them through Scottish government. And with that academic and innovation input, we're seeing Project Orion as being a a, a flagship project internationally that we hope to share the learning from in the coming years. Next slide, please. And the last couple uh, to talk about sustainability. The key here is that engineering expertise will be fundamental to design the future and achieving this transition. And uh, my uh, role as president of the Royal Academy of Engineering has helped us launch the uh, new strategy last year, which is about harnessing the power of uh, engineering to build a sustainable global society, an inclusive economy that works for everyone. We're effective agents for change in the engineering and technology community, and of course, working with our colleagues in broader disciplines, and Cesar is a great example of that. But we need to drive decarbonisation at pace. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And let's uh, remember, last but not least, people are going to be critical. The education of engineers, scientists, those in the social sciences, uh, and we are now promoting a key strand of our academic uh, or, or academy's engineering zero campaign is going to lead up to uh, 20, uh, COP26, which is about identifying future skills, exploring how university courses can ensure sustainability central to engineering education with SDGs at the heart of all of that and requiring registered or professional engineers to continue to undertake sustainability related CPD every year. And my final slide, please. And engineering skills for a net zero world. I would commend to you, please have a look at the Royal Academy of Engineering website and see the campaign, This Is Engineering. 2021. It's already had over 50 million views of our videos, inspiring young people, many of them involving low carbon technology. And we also hope to have a cluster of sustainability projects or Q artifacts in Glasgow at the end of the year. So colleagues, with that, I'll stop and I look forward to hearing others uh, and uh, in discussion later on. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you, Sir Jim. That slide deck that you have will certainly come in handy when we put our foresight document together uh, that we are combining between the Royal Academy and CESAR in terms of uh, advisory board. So now it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Martin Green. Professor Green is the Santia Professor of the University of New South Wales, Sydney, and Director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics. He is considered as the doyen in the field of solar technologies, including the inventor of the Perk cell that 
accounts for nearly 90% of global solar cells currently in use. His group has held the silicon solar cell efficiency record for 30 of the last 38 years. We are indeed privileged, Martin, to have you here. And I must end by saying he has been given the Japan Prize for 2021 in the last few weeks. And we are absolutely here to welcome you. And the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Ravi. Yes, I'm Martin Green, as Ravi mentioned, from UNSW Sydney. Um, and it's now getting late on Friday evening. But there's the iconic Sydney Opera House and a uh, photo in the centre is our lab at the university and uh, then our solar industrial research facility where we've transferred a lot of our technology to industry. So uh, addressing the topic of key technology shaping the future, I'll be talking about one that's going to play a major role and that is, of course, renewable energy. And the International Renewable Energy Agency just yesterday released a report where they mentioned renewable energy as the only way of having a fighting chance of getting to, uh, of maintaining temperature rise to. I think uh, we we are having a few problems there with regard to the feed from um, New South Wales. Um, maybe uh, this this would be a good chance for us to um, probably uh, have our next speaker and then let Martin uh, continue uh, once the the links have been connected. So the the third panelist for the. Uh, so session with regard to the supply end of energy uh, is Emma Harrison. Uh, Emma is the head of systems integration at the Energy Systems Catapult in the UK. She's leading a team of 25 consultants, engineers, and modelers. She leads the Energy Systems Catapult systems approach for net zero activities and is technical lead for the smart systems and heat program and electrification of heat project. So it will certainly give us a, a lovely overview with regard to how we take a systems approach. So Emma, the floor is yours and we will move on to Martin uh, once you finish your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on mute, Emma. Sorry, I should have remembered this after 15 months of this. Thank you, Ravi, and good afternoon. I'm going to talk about achieving net zero with a view from demand side. So Sir Jim has told us about all challenges about providing zero carbon energy, but I'm going to try to look briefly at what needs to be done to achieve net zero downstream. Uh, next slide, please. The challenge of achieving net zero is truly whole system. It will require change from sorry. Sorry about that. The challenge of achieving the net zero target is truly whole system. It will require change from all parts of the UK and all sectors of the economy and from individuals. How does UK transition to a low carbon economy within a generation is a complex and complicated challenge, arguably more complex than anything we have ever done before. We must achieve net zero whilst ensuring economic and social benefits are maintained or enhanced. There are many varied and disparate interests, including parties and sectors that have never worked together before, who will be required to do so in the future. There are high levels of uncertainty in many aspects of the needed transition. There is urgency, 
As we know, we have less than 30 years to achieve net zero, and currently we are not on track. Next slide, please. Net zero implicitly indicates that the whole system sums to zero emissions. And therefore, the solution must be a whole system optimization rather than a component by component development. We need whole system approach, joining up system from sources of energy to the consumer, breaking down silos between different parts of energy system, and most importantly, joining up physical requirements of the system with policy, market, and digital arrangements. We also need to join up national, local, regional, and individual. Any solutions will have consequences for society, economy, environment, and technologies on which they are based. Energy Systems Catapult has created Systems Approach for Net Zero, which is a tailored version of systems engineering process specifically focused on the characteristics of the net zero challenge. A key part of that is something we call system of systems map. It is particularly useful for understanding interactions between different systems, which were previously independent, but will become highly integrated, for example, electricity, hydrogen, transport, buildings, industry, etc. This will require integrated planning, development, operation, and regulation of different systems, and it will have huge impact on value chains. UK has the opportunity to provide a compelling example of decarbonization for the rest of the world, and also to unlock considerable economic opportunities. Next slide, please. As we have heard, decarbonizing heat is one of the most difficult challenges for net zero. It is hard for consumers to know what is best. How should they insulate their house? What technology is right for their home and lifestyle? How it would work? How much would it cost? Who could they trust to provide them with advice? Next slide, please. The best option will also vary from place to place. And that is why local areas have a key role to play. Most local areas have declared climate emergency, but very few have plans how to achieve ambitious targets they set. Decarbonization of heat, buildings, transport, industry needs tailored and integrated local solutions, which will respect local differences but will also take into account that local and national pathways need to align. There is very little capacity and capability in the local authorities to do this work, and they are facing huge challenges. Next slide, please. Also, it is really important to remember that people want very different things from their heating. And Complexity involves, involved makes it even more challenging. So how can we support them to decarbonize their heat whilst achieving outcomes that they want? Next slide, please. What if you could buy heat as a service in a similar way as you buy your mobile phone plan or your Sky TV package? Could that also help decarbonize heat? Our hypothesis is that if people can get comfortable for a fair price, they won't care what heating system they have. They can pick different plants and leave their service provider to make it low carbon. And we have successfully tested this in our living lab. Next slide, please. In addition to testing it in the living lab, we have also used our simulation tool assess if heat as a service could help manage demand and reduce energy cost. For this simulation, we have used 1,000 homes in Bridge End, and we assumed near current market conditions. Blue chart on the left shows how peak demand would exceed 
network capacity shown as a green dotted line during peak times. Red chart on the right shows how peak demand has been reduced by applying demand side management to preheat homes ahead of need. And as you can see from the power chart on the bottom right corner, overall energy usage has increased slightly and total energy costs have reduced slightly. But this also highlights significant market challenges. Main beneficiary of this would be DNO, who could defer or avoid network draft infrastructure upgrades, whilst the benefits to the service provider and consumer would be minimal. And then we have to ask, but what about transport? As Sir Jim said, coordinated planning and action is required at national, local and site levels because there are conflicts to manage, for example, access to con constrained resources, but also synergies to take advantage of, for example, shared investment. Next slide, please. Net zero cannot be achieved by simply throwing money at the problem and deploying traditional approaches. We need intelligent interventions which will draw on digitalization to achieve net zero and significant digital infrastructure would be required to enable effective integration and interoperability and support necessary market transition. And my final slide, please. It is really important to remember that everything has to continue to work as transition occurs. We do not have luxury of a clean sheet of paper or of being able to stop things until we can do what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Emma, for that wonderful presentation and uh, emphasizing the fact that it's not just about throwing money at a problem, but it's actually about having intelligent interventions. Um, I will now go back to Martin, and I must thank him also because he's actually uh, reminded us that we are living in the COVID period where either you're on mute or your link is broken, uh, has to be said if you really do want to have a full session. So Martin, I shall pass on to you uh, to continue or, or start your discussion, please. Okay, thank you, Ravi. So I'll move on to the next slide. I'll be talking about renewable energy. My um, slide progression thing doesn't seem to be turned on. So could I have the next slide? Thanks. Hello, my um, slide motion machine isn't working and I would like the next slide. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, with renewables, I'll be talking specifically about photovoltaics and wind, but with both of them, there's been great progress over the last decade or so. So things have got bigger, more powerful, more efficient, and for a given rating, there's more energy generated. And as uh, Ravi mentioned in his introduction, uh, one of our technologies, the Perk solar cell, has now taken over the solar cell field. And you can see that uh, solar cells are now rectangular rather than square, and that's been one consequence of Perk. And the photo in the lower corner there, that's uh, a modern ma module. They're getting quite large. That's nearly eight foot by five foot. And um, there's a photo from the front and the back. So modules now respond to light from both sides. And again, that's a consequence of the Perk. Um, the biggest thing that's happened, however, in um, renewables has been the cost reductions over the last decade or so, particularly with photovoltaics. And this slide here just shows the average wholesale selling price from 2008 onwards. And uh, you can see that you know, this is the wholesale selling price of the modules, but it has dropped by a factor of 24 in those 12 years. So that's just a really massive um, decrease. Um, and uh, 
it, if you look at the most recent region, this is in the shaded region in the previous slide. This is plotted on a semi-logarithmic graph and you can approximately fit it by a straight line, which means exponentially decreasing prices. And uh, with the photovoltaics, it's been decreasing about 20% um, per year over that sort of time frame. And the interesting thing, the, the red line shows the uh, prices associated with the PERC technology, which, as I mentioned, is the new technology that's recently been introduced. And you can see how it sort of uh, helped drive down the prices even more quickly. So but the competition between the emerging technology and the incumbent has, um, for, has uh, caused cost reductions more rapidly than before. So we're, we're running at over 20% per year cost reduction now. <laughs> And uh, this graph very busy, but it just shows you know other real world data. And this is the price people are paying for electricity supply through power purchase agreements, where you contract for the supply of electricity for 15 or 20 year period generally. But the lower curve there shows the lowest um, bids that have been received for these agreements that are generally conducted by an auction process and the lowest bidder wins. And um, you can see that uh, that's dropped quite dramatically um, over the last uh, seven years or so. And um, very recently, a real landmark was reached in the, the, um, the scale there is dollars per megawatt hour, US dollars, um, but divide by 10 and you get cents per kilowatt hour. And recently a bid was received for one cent a kilowatt hour, which is really quite amazing. So these are the lowest bids. There's also some bids that are a lot higher, and the average bids are shown there in the um, lines are further above. But again, coming down very aggressively. The interesting thing was uh, IRENA, um, the Renewable Energy Agency I mentioned before, um, just did some very detailed calculations using these one cent per kilowatt hour prices that some people are paying for electricity from solar, combined with a wind generator in the area where two cents per kilowatt hour was the price that was contracted for the electricity supply, and worked out the cost of generating hydrogen with the present cost of electrolyzers. And this was only um, reported a couple of weeks back, but $1.62 US per kilogram of hydrogen already at present electrolyzer costs. So we're going, to, we're going to see very cheap hydrogen from renewables down the track. Uh, and the International Renewable Agency has now said that solar provides the cheapest source of electricity in most countries and some of the lowest cost of electricity has ever seen, you know, thinking of these one cent per unit type prices. These uh, reducing prices are increasing the market for both solar and wind in these two graphs. The upper one shows solar and the lower one wind. These are from REN21 report that was just released last week, I believe. But you can see that the, both of these have been growing exponentially, the solar more quickly over the last decade. Um, the brown bit shows the annual addition and the yellow the previous amount that they were added to. Um, if you just project that growth over the coming decade, so it increased a factor of 20 times the volume over that 10 year period, you'd be looking at uh, 15 terawatts of photovoltaics accumulated installation by the end of the decade. But if you did a, a more conservative projection looking at the year where the increase was the smallest and projected at that rate, you'd get a five terawatt level of photovoltaics installed. So I think that's a, quite a reasonable range to expect. With wind, there's less divergence between the two calculations and you get two to three terawatts um, by the end of the decade. Moving on to the next slide. Um, the importance of this, that sort of figure is that uh, to, if you reach somewhere between five and 15 terawatts, you'll be installing photovoltaics somewhere around a terawatt a year towards the end of the coming decade. And that terawatt is really quite significant when you look at the impact that could have on carbon emissions. This is a slide from 2014 before photovoltaics costs had uh, reduced to their present levels. But um, you can see there, you know, the problem we're facing that even despite the best efforts of, um, you know, the many countries, um, we're likely to run into a problem by the end of the decade where we were um, in that the best efforts 
despite the best efforts of these countries, we're going to use the whole budget for um, reaching, a, like in this case, a two degree temperature rise globally. But if you look at the impact of one terawatt of photovoltaics, those are the little arrows on the right there, that's the impact if you're displacing um, uh, coal from electricity generation or oil from transport. I keep clicking the wrong thing to go to the next slide, but here we go. This is um, just the source of global emissions and electricity generation accounts for 38%, which is quite obscene. These are again IRENA figures. When you, when you consider it only contributes about 3% to global GDP. So sort of a disproportionately large impact and then transports the other big contributor. Um, so looking at electricity generation, there are now nine countries that are generating over 20% of their electricity from renewables or wind and, and uh, solar in particular. Um, and uh, UK is there amongst them, Germany, of course. And Australia has just reached that club just very recently. The yellow shows the solar contribution and the um, blue, the wind. So we're going to see that like these numbers have increased very rapidly. So we're going to see that penetration increase worldwide. In Australia, we're seeing a lot more energy storage going in very quickly. So both pumped hydro, so that's the green area in the chart in the background there, and uh, lithium ion batteries, which the yellow region. So this is a big, the photo just shows a big 300 gigawatt uh, a megawatt system that's going into Australia, um, you know, it's getting the size of a of a coal-fired power station or something like that in terms of the backup it can supply. Uh, this slide hasn't come up very well, but it, um, it's showing the uh, present makeup, but the point that I want to show is not there. <laughs> it's not appearing on my screen anyhow. It's just showing the... the um, planned or the or the proposed installations of different things and what i wanted to show was there's a massive amount of battery storage proposed for australia nearly as much as our present coal capacity has been proposed for installation okay so um can we get to a net zero world in 30 years and um there's been this recent study by Lappinrinta university in finland actually um it was published a couple of years ago and more recently um, an updated version in energy but it uh, came to the conclusion you could and um, photovoltaics would play a big role in that as shown in this chart here which just shows the energy mix over the coming 30 years and the uh, yellow and brown and yellow regions of photovoltaics so this study concluded that photovoltaics could provide a, a major impact on uh, on converting the world to a zero carbon situation the blue region is wind so wind and solar have synergies that um, that that allow them to reduce that reduce the amount of storage and so on that you require. So this is just the, the the world map showing you know where the solar and where the wind would be generated. Red means a lot and blue means a little. So the parts of the world where you get a lot of solar, you'd expect that to dominate the energy production in 2050. And uh, blue regions. Uh, Oh, where you might expect wind to um, to do so. The red regions on the second side, I guess, are where the wind is really good. I was surprised to see the UK is expected to have more generation from solar, according to the study, than wind in that sort of time frame. So an interesting result. And uh, this study was driven by costs. So there was a carbon um, cost introduced into the study to drive it towards a low carbon future. But the end result was that you ended up with lower costs from that conversion. So uh, net zero world in 30 years, I think renewable energy has a big role to play. Um, we're going to see the cost reductions in silicon photovoltaics continue at about that same rate that uh, we've seen historically, that 20% a year, at least over the next um, half of the coming decade, at least. So we're going to see photovoltaics drop from what is already the cheapest source of electricity in most countries to insanely cheap cost levels. So that's going to allow things that didn't seem feasible before, like cheap hydrogen from renewable energy. Um, new technology, and there's plenty of that in the wings, um, uh, helps accelerate the cost reduction. And uh, we've seen that for the case of the Perk technology that uh, we helped get onto the market. 
Um, there's very complementary roles between solar and wind, and we're seeing that very clearly in Australia. And uh, pumped hydro, there's a lot of new pumped hydro capacity going to Australia, batteries, mainly lithium ion, although some redox. Um, and transmission is the other. Beefing up the transmission is really important to take a p advantage of geographical diversity, and we're seeing that as well. So I, I think um, solar and wind will play a major role in getting us to this zero net uh, energy world, net carbon world in the next 30 years. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. That's excellent. What, what we'll probably do is to spend five minutes uh, in, in, with a Q&A session and, and then move on to the other talks in, in order to ensure we have some uh, timeliness. But maybe if I can uh, pose to the panel the first question that has come through, uh, which is, what will be the hardest sector to decarbonize? So uh, maybe, the, Sir Jim, this is something that you could uh, elaborate on? Sure, thanks, Ravi. Uh, well, no sector is going to be easy, Ravi. So uh, uh, what I would say, and uh, Emma's touched on it, on it the, the built environment and the construction industry, simply because it touches everyone's lives uh, and there's going to be a need for strong behavioural change and citizens' engagement. That's going to be tough, but it's going to be absolutely essential. And we're talking about, let's be frank, in the UK alone over the next uh, few decades, you know, many tens of and arguably hundreds of billions of pounds that are going to have to be committed on re-engineering the built environment. Uh, and that means people are going to have to be engaged in whether it's insulation, new technology, digitization, you know, new fleet, to, you know, new construction is great. But that, that, that's going to be a, a, a big challenge, but it needs to be addressed. But uh, there'll be some early winners as well in terms of decarbonizing industrialization processes. Hydrogen's been mentioned a few times. And with the cost of carbon starting to be baked in to what industry faces in terms of its costs and generation and further regulation, we can accelerate that further and we can get some earlier wins, not e no easy wins, but earlier wins through transport, whether it's on the electrification of transport, the energy systems catapult, as Emma knows, has done some modelling for 2050 in the UK, where we need to perhaps double or more our electrical production to satisfy this decarbonised journey. But if we do that, we, we make a, a move towards it. And with aviation and marine, there are some sectors that can be moving quicker. None of it is easy, but I think the big chestnut to crack is going to be the domestic environment and the built environment. Thank you. And Emma, I'm going to put you on the hot seat next. In, in following that, asking you, uh, is there enough being done in R&D, particularly with the energy catapult activities and making sure this is managed appropriately? And if the answer is not enough, how do we increase this? So you need to unmute and over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh a lot of things are being done, but is it enough? Probably not. And I think the biggest challenge we are facing is what I describe as integrated approach and whole system approach, because we need to consider how to decarbonize, I don't know, heating and transport in an integrated way so that interventions and investment we make can support both of these rather than having to do it twice. And then another very important thing is some of these things are technological challenge, but other things are to do with markets, with people preferences and behavior. And that, that bit, in my view, is probably in some ways more challenging because currently different government departments have responsibility for buildings or transport or industry. And unless we can develop integrated system approach, I don't think we can make fast enough and effective enough process. Thank you. So I'm going to ask the next question from Martin and then the panel can address the final question. The final question is, what one message would you like to deliver to the COP26 negotiators? But before that, uh, Martin, maybe you could answer the point with your very optimistic view of uh, wind and solar 
do you believe we will meet all our targets and become net zero by in the next 30 years i think we we have a chance so the um the costs of solar have really come down quite dramatically and are still coming down and uh it's been very difficult to overestimate the impact of, of solar in particular, in that it's far exceeded uh, anyone's expectations, even someone who's naturally an optimist like myself. Um, so, uh, like in the Australian situation, everything's just being driven by the economics, like the solar and wind are so much cheaper than the incumbent technologies that um, investors are just installing the, the systems and uh, we're seeing a flood of uh, that type of technology onto the market and now we're seeing batteries with a similar flood. So it's all just being driven by the economics in the Australian scene, you know, because our government, uh, as you might be aware, is not particularly supportive of renewables and is very much tied to the incumbent technologies. So I'll take um, that as a yes and maybe I can pass on that final question to you. For COP26, the UK has the presidency. It's in Jim's hometown. He can persuade the world leaders as to what they need to do. So what's your one plea to the negotiators at COP26? Is that for me, Ravi, is it? Yes, or? yes, it's with you, then Emma, and finally, Sir Jim. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think coordinated world effort is is needed, and um, uh, we do have some governments. Um, I can think of one in particular that are quite recalcitrant about uh, honouring commitments and so on. And uh, there's been a lot of spin put on um, the efforts that are being made to meet obligations and so on. So I think holding uh, countries accountable to the commitments they've made and finding a way of um, firming those commitments is going to be very important. Uh, thank you, Martin. Emma, to you? Uh, I agree with Martin, and I would also say that even within uh, national governments and devolved governments in the UK, we need to have very clear responsibility for net zero. Uh, currently, it is distributed among, among many different uh, departments, so someone needs to be responsible and we have to start thinking not only about how, what net zero world could look like, but how do we successfully transition to that in a way that uh, delivers not only net zero, but other benefits. Uh, thank you. And the last comment to Sir Jim. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, and I agree with the points that uh, Martin and Emma has made. So uh, I will have the pleasure of having uh, several one-to-one -one conversations with the leaders that will be in the city, Ravi, as you've pointed out. So I'd like to think that after 2021, uh, when people talk about the energy gap, it won't be in a negative. They'll talk about the energy gap where GAP stands for the Glasgow Action Plan. <laughs> and we now move forward to go from strategy to implementation and action. Thank you very much, Sajib. Uh, let me thank the whole panel for that amazing first half to our program. And now swiftly move on to the second half. Uh, and the second half is going to be kicked off uh, by uh, Dr. Chad Frischman, who's the Senior Director for Research and Technology of Project Drawdown. Chad is the co-author and lead researcher and principal architect of the methodology and models behind Drawdown, um, which is the most comprehensive plan pr proposed to reverse global warming. Leading a global team of researchers, Chad designed and integrated global models to assess the world's most effective climate solutions and determine if and when, how the world can reach Drawdown. Over to you, Chad. Thank you, Ravi, and thank you to my fellow panelists for such an amazing, amazing talk. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all uh, today, all you amazing engineers from around the world that are taking part in this program. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you about real solutions, actions that we can all take starting today to help us stop global warming, but also get us on a pathway towards the regenerative future that we want. But as a starting point, how do we actually solve the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced? 
How do we solve the climate emergency that we're facing today that uh, we will continue to face tomorrow, children tomorrow and grandchildren and future generations to come? Well, a prerequisite to solving the climate crisis is achieving the point of drawdown. And drawdown is a point in time when atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begin to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. It's that point when we're taking out more of those heat-trapping gases than we're putting into Earth's atmosphere to start with. So this is going beyond net zero. Um, and uh, um, so uh, beyond net, 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 net zero. And um, uh, so how do we actually start this? How do we go beyond net zero? How do we pull out more of those heat trapping gases? The proposition here is really pretty simple. When we can change the concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases, we can essentially stop global warming and begin the long process of reversing it. But how do we start? Well, first we have to understand where are the emissions coming from to start with, next slide. I don't know if I'm frozen here or not. Sorry, I don't know. No, if you're slide fine. Yeah, forward. absolutely fine. <laughs> okay, so I can't see my slides, but so the first thing we have to understand is where are the where are the sources of emissions? Where are they coming from to start with? So that gives us that we can understand what are the solutions to turn the sources off. Once emissions are in the atmosphere. What are the sinks or natural or engineered processes that we have to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it safely? And three, uh, there we are. Three, what are the ways that we can th really look at how we function as a society and as a an economy to ensure that when we're implementing solutions, we do so from a systemic point of view um, with a human rights-based approach, with justice, equity and inclusion at the very heart of everything we do. How do we shift the system itself, which is historically and currently uh, uh, based on an extractive uh, and exploitative model? And how do we shift that to a new normal that's by nature restorative and regenerative? And that places well-being for people and planet at the very core of what we do as a society and an economy. Well, as a starting point, where are all the emission? Uh, pardon, I think there's uh, there's, some, there's a slide. So I lead a team of researchers and writers from all over the world, and together we've mapped, modeled, and described real existing technologies or practices that touch upon almost all areas of human activity. We've heard about many of them today from the previous panelists that focus principally on those sources of emissions. Right, that touch upon energy systems, how we generate electricity, our transportation systems, built environment, industry, how we move around in the world. But it's also we have to remember that that's not that's only about 75 percent of the problem. Twenty four percent of all global greenhouse gases comes from uh, the food, agriculture and land use. How and why we use land produces a tremendous amount of emissions. But this is also a source of what are those sinks? natural carbon sinks that pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere every year through the magic and the miracle of photosynthesis, which converts carbon dioxide to plants biomass and soil organic carbon. So when we map and model a system of solutions that addresses all of the sources of emissions that enhance the sinks and improve society as a whole, we can map a new framework of how to solve for climate. And because all of these solutions have cascading benefits to human and planetary well-being, we can solve not only for climate, but also catalyze that pathway towards the future uh, that we want, towards a regenerative future, and solve for many other global challenges. But what do these solutions actually do? These solutions could do one or more of three things to reduce all of this stuff, all of the things that we consume, whether that's reducing the amount of electricity generation, amount of uh, materials that we're producing, the amount of overconsumption of food that we have, to reduce that through technological efficiencies and behavior change, to replace those technologies and practices that are contributing to the problem with alternatives that are part of the solution, 
And three, to restore carbon to useful forms through those natural sinks, which improve soil productivity and health, increase yield and benefit smallholder farmers, large farming operations alike, and is an essential factor into our food security of the future, but also maybe in the future engineered sinks when they become more uh, economically viable and scientifically valid. But it's through a combination of these three mechanisms and only these three mechanisms that drawdown becomes possible. And we have to remember that what drawdown is, is going beyond a net zero world. We have to go beyond a net zero world because every year we're producing so much emissions that 59% of all those emissions stay in the atmosphere because you know the rest get pulled down from, from those natural sinks. But every year that that builds up emissions in the atmosphere, that builds up additional climate change, temperature change, and we're expecting that already built into the system. So we need to go beyond net zero to a world of drawdown to pull that carbon out and solve the challenges that we're facing today. The good thing is that there's many existing technologies that can address all of these areas of human activity. And this, um, I hope there's a list up here, and there's a list of uh, uh, 25 or so of the most substantive technologies and practices um, that, uh, when taken together, can achieve that point of drawdown. And to the right of that slide, you see gigatons of reduced CO2 equivalent uh, that can be either avoided and or sequestered over a 30-year period from 2020 to 2050. The number on the left represents a scenario aligned with the two degrees Celsius warming target, and then the number to the right uh, aligned with the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming target. Now, I don't have a tremendous amount of time to go into all of these solutions. And I do wanna point out these are 25 of over 82 different technologies and practices that we, uh, we map, model, and describe uh, through our integrated systems approach. Um, but the important thing I think to really highlight here is that it's not just energy systems. It's not just electricity generation. When we think about solutions to climate, we tend to think about those coal, oil, and gas-fired plants. And we heard from Martin the incredible importance of renewable energy systems. And it is absolutely important. It counts for about 25% of all global greenhouse gases. But we have to remember that there are solutions across all of those areas of human activity that touch about just about everything we do. Yes, electricity, buildings, uh, transportation, and industry, these are incredibly important. But we have to think about the very, uh, the very things that, uh, food that we consume every day, what we're consuming, and how we're consuming it, and how we're producing that food, and how we're managing our land, are not only help to avoid emissions, but enhance those natural sinks that allow us to actually achieve that point of drawdown. This is the future what we want, that we want to show, is that drawdown is possible, and it's possible for when you, you, know, when you, when you think about how much all of this is gonna cost to implement. Um, Chad, could you uh, come down to a conclusion in the next minute or so? Yeah, sure, I'm sorry, the slides are just a little, um, it's through the system of solutions taken together that we can achieve drawdown, and we need all of these solutions. There are no uh, silver bullets, no silos, no one sector or another sector. One top 10, top 20, top 30 or 40 solutions are going to get us there. We need all 80 solutions to achieve a net zero world, and frankly, we need to go beyond net zero. We need to reach a point where we're, where, uh, where we're just... Uh, ceasing, stopping to emit em emissions and uh, uh, sequestering carbon at a rate where we can achieve that point of drawdown. And that is the one and only way that we're going to get onto that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. It is possible to achieve through a drawdown system. Here is the uh, composition of the solutions that are readily available, exist today, economically viable, scientifically valid, currently scaling, that are going to get us on that 1.5 degrees Celsius warming target. You see the top 25 take the lion's share of impact, but we need all 82 solutions, and we want these solutions, whether or not global warming was even a problem, uh, because they all have ca those cascading benefits to human and planetary well-being. Um, and... Uh, uh, when we adopt this as a system of solutions, we can not only, uh, and so just real quickly, the cost of these solutions is about 20 to $30 trillion, more than what we would have to spend anyway, but there's a net operational savings for that system of solutions between 90 and $150 trillion over that same time period using conservative uh, financial estimations. Uh, drawdown is possible. The future that we want is possible. 
and um, uh, but only when we reimagine those ex existing systems and see the global system of systems connecting local to global to local. Everything is interconnected, as we heard previously. Um, and uh, thanks very much, Chad. I think that's a fantastic so uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and and I'll leave you with the thought of saying, with the amazing work Drawdown is doing, what is stopping us not going down that path and reaching that goal when we come to the panel session. So uh, Adam Wentworth is going to continue with regard to how uh, we as uh, citizens need to also play our part in getting to net zero. Adam Wentworth uh, is the communications manager at Good Energy, one of the UK's first 100 renewable power suppliers. He has spent the last 10 years working in energy policy and climate change issues. He is formerly the editor of Climate Action and International Climate and Sustainability Publications. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, so I'm not an engineer and I'm coming from this from, from a comms and policy perspective uh, and um, wanted to give really an update in, in terms of you know, net zero over the next 30 years to give an update on, on what we at Good Energy have been doing in terms of some research. So we commissioned uh, Energy Systems Catapult to do uh, some research into how you can reach net zero in Britain uh, in over the next 30 years. So this is the name of the report, Renewable Nation Pathways to a Zero Carbon Britain. And the next slide just illustrates a little bit more about what we, what we did. Uh, we, we commissioned uh, ESC to model a, a net zero future under a set of distinct scenarios, ones which we felt were rarely modelled by the energy industry, one which uh, really focused primarily on how you'd get there using renewables. So how would we do it? Uh, how would we just go um, all out for, for, for renewables rather than um, thinking that maybe we'd build new uh, nuclear plants or whether or not we'd have any other technologies to, to support us? So um, we these distinct scenarios, which the, on the next slide it illustrates just a little bit about what those scenarios were. I won't go into too much detail, but um, it, we... we we used a baseline scenario, which is a kind of business as usual. There's no central planning of, and uh, we get to net zero through, uh, you know, living patterns uh, evolve gradually. Uh, our zero carbon Britain scenario is the final scenario, which was informed through the use of some of these other scenarios, which included um, a, uh, the renewables to 11, which is where wind and solar really um, continue with reducing costs. Uh, Flex revolution is uh, customer based. Uh, decentralized uh, uh, scenario, uh, hydrogen economy, as you might uh, think, is, is one where uh, very high ca carbon capture rates uh, are, are used as a key enabler for decarbonization. Um, and no unicorns is really a counterfactual scenario where um, certain innovation steps which would be needed, to, say, uh, for carbon capture technology or the electrification of heat aren't present. So it's uh, assuming that those don't take place and seeing what happened. But as I say, um, baseline and zero carbon Britain were the two scenarios which we compared. And the zero carbon Britain scenario is one where you have very high levels of renewables, not just wind and solar, but wave geothermal and tidal and other, other technologies, as well as having a sort of very high consumer focus, uh, home storage, self-generation, and you've got political certainty around the, the direction of travel and high, higher innovation spend. So the, so the outcome uh, of these scenarios, the next slide uh, gives us uh, an illustration of some of the key findings that we uh, established. So electrification of everything. So the energy system is fully decarbonized uh, across heat and transport. So, uh, so electrification is a real key enabler of, of um, decarbonization, as, as, uh, as you'd expect, perhaps. People power, so significant investment in energy efficiency, home storage and, and uh, generation. We know this next stage of decarbonization is going to definitely have people at the center and that our uh, modeling bears that out. Uh, renewable nation, so we, we found that 98% of all electricity demand is possible to be met with, with renewables. Wind and solar are supported by marine and geothermal. Uh, the only, the remaining part of that is we assumed that in Britain, um, Hinkley Point C nuclear power plant will still be in operation, so we had that uh, assumption built in. Uh, and as you'd expect, with a very large uh, electricity system with very high levels of renewables, storage and flexibility are, are crucial. So the full range of 
uh, all storage technologies, large scale batteries, pump storage, all of all of that tech and, and new tech is going to be needed to help even out peaks in demand and help secure it supply. And then the final one, um, costs are competitive. So despite the sort of philosophical constraints that we applied uh, to the modeling, they still came within uh, what we thought of as a, a manageable range of uh, up to 1.5% of, of GDP per year in, in 2050. The next slide uh, illustrates um, this, this sort of picture of the future a little bit more. So you've got a high deployment of, of offshore wind and solar. Um, we've estimated it would mean 50% of all homes and businesses will have solar panels, you'll have around 10 million homes, will have uh, battery storage uh, devices. H at high levels of energy efficiency will be needed to reduce uh, heat demand in particular because you have very high electrification of heat. So that's really key in Britain. And then uh, one of the other ones is high levels of um, uh, electric vehicles. And not only the, the normal electric vehicles as well, there'll be smart EV charging really needing to, uh, to shift demand uh, from peak parts of the day. And the uh, graph on the right illustrates uh, what the storage, the amount of storage that you would need in a sort of one in 10 year stress test event that we deployed. So you'd need, so in a, in a very distressed system with very high levels of renewables, um, it is possible, but it is possible with lots of storage and flexibility, as you'd expect. The next slide gives a nice illustration of exactly what that would look like. 2050 in Britain, 98% uh, renewables doing all of the heavy lifting. Uh, offshore wind is the kind of workhorse of the energy mix, um, but still supported by onshore wind, large scale solar and domestic solar playing a, playing a real role, as we know that they can. And then the other part of it is um, tidal wave and geothermal, but all sort of nascent, underdeveloped technologies in Britain would, would have to play a role if we were to, 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 to go for, for a more renewable system. Next slide just illustrates um, the costs are manageable. Um, there's a lot more to say on this, this issue, but I'm just, just flicking through in terms of the main, the main points. So our baseline scenario is one where, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, there was no central planning. You could build out uh, new nuclear plants as you want. Uh, and our zero carbon Britain was a very constrained uh, system on the model, and yet both um, costs are almost identical. And we worked out that decarbonisation would add uh, in 2050 a minimum of, of 14 billion per year on top of what we would have to be spending on uh, anyway at the energy system at the moment. So this is an eminently possible uh, scenario. It's an option for people to, to consider that this is, this is something that uh, we, we, we could go for. Finally, the final slide on the back of um, this work, we developed five principles for net zero. Each of these principles come with uh, recommendations uh, alongside them. And they're, they're some of the things that we, we were familiar with, really, they, they include doing the known now. That means just, um, you know, kind of getting on with it, uh, increasing the amount of money we spend on in innovation and R&D in Britain, which is lower than some other uh, uh, European countries. So we're suggesting 1.5% of GDP on net zero research and development, for example. Um, so really accelerating things on that side, unleashing people power, as I've said, all communities and households will need to participate in the energy transition. So we need to have consumers at the heart. I think up to now, uh, consumers haven't really been involved in the current progress in, in decarbonisation. The next stages will really have to have them front and centre in terms of engagement. And also, um, everyone has to be brought along from deprived areas, from low incomes everywhere. Um, embrace diversity. I'll quickly run through these. This is about uh, using tailored solutions as we get closer to net zero. You might have hydrogen clusters in some parts of the country. You might have uh, district heat networks where that's appropriate. Um, we should focus on those technologies which also have the potential to, to integrate with wind and solar. Um, and um, most appropriately, making the best of Britain, that's uh, we've got great renewable sources in Britain, we've got great uh, natural resources, we should be using all of them, and we should be using all of our strong academic and research capabilities for net zero, these are all things that we do well, we should be doing more of them. Thank Thanks you. Of this. Thank you, Adam. That's fantastic. I think that's a great uh, point in which, if you don't mind, we'll bring yeah. Alex in as we're running out of, of time at present. Sure. So uh, I think, Alex, you, as a lead of technology and innovation for COP26, which has come up many times in the discussions, and Adam's uh, intro there saying 
you know, there's a lot that needs to be done through the universities and society and people power. Um, I'll give the floor to you. Alex Josh is the lead uh, for technology and innovation uh, and for Climate Champions Team COP26. Having started his career in engineering, he's moved to McKinsey and Company, where he spent five years leading projects across a variety of industries. Alex, over to you uh, on your presentation. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, conscious of time. So um, we've heard a lot about COP26 in the last hour. I just want to press into that and the significance of that event and how we relate to it as an audience. And I'm going to share some general thoughts on how technology-led systems change generally unfolds much faster than we expect it to. So if we go to the next slide, or actually, let's, let's stay here for one sec. So on COP26, go back to the previous slide, COP26, what is it? Um, Obviously, it's a major conference on climate change. It's hosted here, as we've heard, for a fortnight starting on the 31st of October. What's in that name? So COP is the Conference of Parties. And, and that means a conference of all the countries that are party to the UN agreements on climate change, all 196 of them. And it's the 26th time that this annual meeting has been held, hence COP26. And it's the political epicentre of the process for addressing the climate crisis. And this is a crisis that will only be resolved through more ambitious policymaking um, and greater political ambition. And I think often as citizens or as engineers, we can feel quite distanced from this governmental process. And, and that's a mistake because we're central to it. And that's the single most important point that I want to make today. We're integral to the politics. And what we think and say and do and feel affects the way that governments behave. And we can empower them, not just as leaders, but as followers to set bolder policy in a way that addresses the climate crisis with the urgency that we need them to. So if we go to the next slide, everyone will be familiar with Paris, uh, next slide, please. Could we have the next slide, please? Team, are you there? Perhaps it's frozen. Anyway. Everyone's familiar with Paris and um, at COP21, so six years ago, the Paris Agreement was, was formed. And there we pledged to limit temperature increases to one and a half degrees. Are we still live? I see the screen's gone a bit black. Yes, but the screen has gone black, Alex. <laughs> okay, you're no, back no on. At all. all right, great. Um, okay, fine. So Paris Agreement, pledge to limit global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees. Um, what you're seeing on the slide here is, is where we currently are, right? 1.2 degrees. And I think often there can be a, a kind of a cognitive dissonance that happens when we think about the, the size of that number. It feels very incremental, but it's important to remember that global surface temperatures are 14 degrees on average. And so it's a really, really big change in a very short period of time. And it's just a global average. So it, it varies by region, and there are some regions like the Arctic where it's happening twice as fast. So we can't eliminate the risk of climate change, it's here. And when we think about climate change and technology, we often first think about how to stop emissions. That's been the focus of the conversation today. And that prevents the problem from getting worse. But we also need to think about technology and innovation to deal with the problem that we've already created, the more extreme weather events that we've locked in, which are being felt by the world's most vulnerable populations and despite the, the injustice that they've contributed the least to the problem. So we need to harness the power of things like AI that will deliver better forecasting technologies and weather warning systems and urban planning um, that can unlock new material science. And we need engineers to help in, innovate and build better shelters, for example, for the billion people that still live in slums. And we need, need sort of new fintech or business model innovation um, such as insurance products for smallholder farmers so that the lives and livelihoods of the people most affected by climate change today aren't being wiped out um, in a single season of extreme heat. 
On this slide, I think we can move over this. It's been well covered today. The balloon here is simply just to show that is the average um, footprint of uh, greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis per capita. And for wealthier European countries, you can imagine three hot air balloons. And that just really sort of visualizes the size of this problem. Um, we have to halve emissions by 2030. And I've put net zero by 20 in the 2040s here. We often hear it associated with 2050. Um, but every year earlier that we reach net zero, we reduce economic damage and human suffering and we protect lives and livelihoods. Um, and most importantly, it reduces the risk of us hitting climatic tipping points like losing the whole of the Icelandic, uh, Greenlandic ice sheet or runaway melting of permafrost. Um, and if we go to the, the next slide, you know, the nature of these conferences are changing. It's now about fulfilling the promise of the Paris Agreement. That requires the whole of society. And so it's not just political heavy, heavyweights like John Kerry. We need massive voices from the youth movement and the electorate of tomorrow. We need um, indigenous leaders. We need faith groups behind this as well. And if you go to the next slide and click through a couple of times till the images appear, you'll, you'll see that we're entering this really exciting period where we're seeing society embrace the goals of the Paris Agreement in city halls, um, like we saw in the US, in schoolrooms and in boardrooms, um, and increasingly in, in courtrooms with precedents being set in the Netherlands with the landmark ruling for Shell. And overall, 15% of the global economy is now covered by businesses, investors, cities, regions, things that aren't governments who have committed to adopt the goals of the Paris Agreement. And on the next slide, you see a very simple visual, which shows this ambition loop that happens, which is where we can help policymakers be emboldened by raising our own political ambition and this virtuous feedback loop unfolds. And then if we just go to the penultimate slide, so if we just flick through, I realize we're, we're short of time here. I wanted to say that um, there's a slide with sort of three images on it, one before. So we've covered this political ambition and, and this political feedback loop, um, but the same logic and the same pace of change applies to the development of new technologies. And when we first deploy a new technology, we gain new experience in how to produce it more efficiently. And that leads to the manufacturing cost declines that you've heard of in the last hour and a half. Um, and that in turn unlocks new use cases and new market segments, which drives further deployment. And so that positive feedback loop technologically and economically can also unfold and it's non-linear. And so we get caught off guard by it um, because deployment can suddenly reach an inflection point and it rolls out much faster than we expected. But if we looked closely enough, we would have seen that the trend was there to spot all along. And we've seen that play out with the deployment of renewables, where it's completely outpaced expectations of analysts everywhere. We're starting to see it unfold with battery costs and the deployment of electric vehicles, which I'm sure we can talk about further. And if we look even earlier stage, there are technologies like cultured meats, where the cost curve is reducing exponentially at a similar rate that was seen to the sequencing costs of the human genome. Um, and so just to sum up, we need to change faster than ever before. Um, you know, 18% of your audience think we'll hit net zero by 2050. But uh, luckily, pos these positive feedback loops mean change unfolds often a lot faster than we expect it will. And in, in Glasgow, we will hear reasons to feel both optimistic and outraged by our progress in achieving the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. Reaching that goal is going to require a whole of society and we need to be more ambitious ourselves as a result. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for finishing on that very positive note and the fact that the UK have got a key uh, position at present at COP26 to make sure that we honor the commitment that has been made to human society. Uh, all I can say is we've had 90 minutes of wonderful visionary uh, talks and ideas on how to achieve net zero. Certainly, I think we are in safe hands in terms of uh, having ideas that can be implemented. But as we've seen, we've had problems associated with IT. So there's nothing that is unfallible. So once more, you need an engineer to be able to do the risk assessment. 
And as a result of us losing that time, unfortunately, we are not going to have time for the panel session. But let me, on behalf of the organizers, thank all our speakers. We've had six wonderful speakers who have really brought to light the problems and the issues associated with this significant, uh, extraordinary problem that we are facing today. And certainly solutions and challenges have been put forward. We have but one earth, and it is our primary duty to cohabit and live in a symbiotic manner and not to harm the planet or humanity while we stay here. We haven't done a great job so far, and maybe today could be the start of a significant new journey in order to make a safer, brighter, more equitable and sustainable world for tomorrow. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you, audience, for your participation. And thank you to speakers for making this session such a wonderful interactive session. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thanks. Well, that was an amazing session. So many ideas. Uh, thank you to Professor Ravi Silva and all the panelists who took part. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now, and um, because we're running over, we're going to squash the uh, break a little bit if it's okay, all okay with you guys. So we're going to take a break, uh, stretch your legs, have a glass of water, and uh, please be back here for three o'clock for the next session. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've had a good rest. And now on to the final session of the day. Our final session is on learning and teaching in the world of 2050. We've seen during the pandemic how an entire society can adapt to online learning almost overnight. But we've also seen how quickly inequalities can rise when, when the access to digital tools um, can inform the quality of the education you receive. We've all had examples of that, I'm sure, ourselves. And even in the way we learn, and even if the way we learn changes, can, we, can, we, uh, can what we learn change quickly enough to keep pace with how fast the world is changing around us. Now, before we go on to our speakers today, let's go have a quick poll. Um, we love polls. By 2050, you'll see the poll coming up in the box underneath the screen. Um, and the question is, by 2050, do you think that, in general, the impact of digital technology on education in Europe will be, A, to open up new opportunities for more people, B, will it reinforce existing inequalities, C, it won't have much of an impact either way. Or D, who needs an education system? We all learn to code in our spare time. Yeah, I'm sure many of us learn, do learn to spare and code in our spare time. Right, now, before we, go, before we go into the next session, it'd be good to know from you what the real results that is, so get voting. Um, our next session, as I said, we'll, we'll talk about education during the pandemic, and um, it will be my pleasure to introduce two panel chairs who will be helping us navigate this landscape. Uh, Johan Blaus is Director of Strategic Partnerships at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and Professor James Teen is the Distinguished Professor at the University of Miami. He's also the Foreign Secretary of the US National Academy of Engineering. Now, before we go to their panel, let's have a look at the results of the poll. So if we can have the results up, please. Uh, here we go. So the question was, by 2050, do you think that in general, the impact of digital technology on education in Europe will be, okay, let's have a look. To open up new opportunities for more people, 80% of you, as might be expected from a technologically literate and optimistic group of people, 10% um, of you still think it, would, it will reinforce existing inequalities, which is concerning, and another 10% think that... Um, who needs an education system anyway? So there's a there's a real dichotomy of views, at least in the in the minority there. But most of you, 80%, think that you're going to open up new opportunities. And it really feels that way, doesn't it? Especially given the last year. It has been a bit difficult uh, learning online, but everyone did it. And perhaps that's the massive cultural shift we need to allow people to start thinking about how to make that experience better. Because we did it in an emergency in the past 12 months, but uh, who knows how good it can be if people actually think about it and make it much, much better and make sure that the technological infrastructure is also there. So it's now my pleasure to introduce the two panel chairs that I mentioned before, who will be helping us navigate this landscape. Uh, Johan and James, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I can say when we start that James' uh, uh, camera is not working, but his microphone is working very well, so it would work fine anyway in, in this uh, session. Uh, so this is the final session of these two days and we have explored trends in the key technologies for the last two days in, in the themes of healthy society, safe and secure equitable society and net zero world. And uh, of course uh, those key uh, technologies will have implications for, for the ed education and teaching and learning and that's what we are going to explore now in this session. So, uh, the structure of the session is that we will have a similar setup uh, uh, like the previous ones. We will have four speakers uh, during the session and then follow up by a Q&A session. And I uh, encourage you all that to take part of this to, to post your uh, questions in, in, the, in the chat so we can, can uh, have it in, in the Q&A. Uh, I mean, Many things of the things that have been discussed in the three previous sessions is relevant for this session as, as well, of course, for the key technologies. And as we heard from the president of CISAR, Rick van der Waal, uh, before today, the complexity uh, increases. And we will explore that a little bit in what implications that have, have for uh, teaching and learning. And uh, it was uh, stated in a poll uh, before the session started that 
most of you believe that it, it will increase the inclusion. And that's something that this panel will explore a little bit. And uh, we will also explore what role will the universities have in the, in the future development of, of, uh, of uh, those technologies and also coupled to, to education. And what possible strategies and scenarios can we expect? So with that uh, introduction, I, I um, do you want to say some introductory words as well, uh, James, before we uh, introduce yeah. our first uh, speaker? Well, uh, first, I'm sorry for my uh, you know, camera problem, but uh, I'd like to kind of just introduce Johan since he's already spoken. Uh, he's a director of strategic partnerships at Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and he'll be my uh, co-collaborator uh, here. And go ahead, Johan, why don't you introduce our first speaker? Yes, I will certainly do that. Before I do that, I just want to mention, as, uh, as James say, I, I'm a director for strategic partnerships, and that means that I have a lot of dialogue with stakeholders, primarily, of course, the, uh, the strategic partnerships. And actually this year, we have a follow-up of the consequences of the pandemic, of what they see, what long-term consequences will that have of the future engineers. And I will, I'm really interested in taking part of the discussion and presentation today from our speakers because we will continue workshops with strategic partners to explore how will the future engineer look like. And we have some themes like uh, soft skills, digital skills, uh, sustainable development, uh, understanding of systems and uh, learning for life. And, and uh, the first speaker here will explore more. I mean, all universities has been uh, working actively with online teaching the last 15 months due to the pandemic. So we will start with um, uh, Lee Rubenstein. And Lee is uh, actually substituting for Anant Agarwal, the founder of, of uh, edX. Uh, and the reason why, and uh, Lee will tell us a little bit more about that, is that just two days ago, uh, edX was sold. Um, and uh, Lee has been engaged in EDEC for a long period of time, and he will uh, dig into uh, the opportunities uh, for, for the future for the online and blended learning. So with that, the stage is yours, Lee. Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Very happy to be here. And uh, I'm also going to just fiddle with this slide for a second so I can see the same slides you're looking at. Okay. Uh, one second. Perfect. All right, everybody. Well, I, I'm awfully glad to have this opportunity to do this. I have been with Anant since the beginning when we started edX. And uh, two days ago, edX was purchased by 2U. And 2U is a world leading OPM company. And we thought that this was a strength to strength development. Some of you may have heard about it. It certainly is going to accelerate our path into the future as educators because of the amazing things that we can do now, which we call from free to degree. And that is a long journey, but it is going to be a lifelong journey for many people that are in the workforce today. Also, the money that was received has gone into a uh, new foundation and uh, it will be funded for $800 million and run by Harvard and MIT, and they will own the license for open edX. We'll continue to propagate that, create the next generation of program, create the AI tools that will help uh, hybrid education be more effective and include a vast and large population of people that right now are left behind. They don't go to college. They didn't go to college. They didn't have an opportunity to do that. So uh, very excited to be with you. A nonsense his apologies. I will try to do my best. I know a lot of his stories and I've been there for most of them. Next slide, please. So with that said, uh, let me just set the table for you about what edX is and has done uh, since we started in 2012 and then what we've seen during the pandemic and how that leads to the brilliant path to change that 30 years from now will be the new normal for all of us. And frankly, I think it's started already and it's very significant in terms of the changes. So for those of you that don't know, edX started uh, back then. It was founded by Harvard and MIT. It now has 38 million registered learners from every country in the world. There's over 3,000 courses on edX. There are 100 
there's a thousand plus corporations that have taken the edX catalog and embedded it for teaching their employees. Uh, we've awarded 2.1 million certificates. The courses are very rigorous on edX. Many of you are members of edX <coughs> and have courses here. So that's a phenomenal amount of people that have taken and passed courses, not for credit, for certificates. And that's the reason that we're able to scale it and offer it to such a wide population at such a low cost. There are free audit track versions of courses. So if a learner wants to learn, doesn't want the certificate and doesn't care, then that's one thing. If they do want the certificate that comes from the university that's offering the course, then they sign up in the certificate track. Next slide. One of the interesting things about that previous slide was that we have innovated some new types of learning programs, which are collections of courses. Uh, one of them that you saw on that screen was called a MicroMasters. And a MicroMasters is about 25% of a master's degree. There are about 60 of them on edX today. And if you took them and you applied to the school and they accepted you into their master's program, they would grant you 25% off the time and cost of a master's degree. So what did we just do? We took the ability to take a master's course from the world's top universities, Oxford, Cambridge, MIT, Harvard, NYU, Caltech, take those courses, use them to learn, have a certificate that changes the dynamic of the relationship between you and the university for the rest of your life and proceed to have the career that you want to have. For those that never went to college, there was another one called micro bachelors and a micro bachelors. This is the new concept I want you to think about. Some of what we're going to talk about today is going to be very disruptive and some of it may make you a little edgy. Some of it you'll agree with some you may uh, uh, violently disagree with and that's okay as long as we get some reactions from the team. But the micro bachelors is a way to take a series of courses that would provide you the entry level or middle skills that you need to get into the high demand job areas in IT and data science and business and finance, even though you've never had any college. Unlike all the other edX courses, they come with credit. The universities agreed together to work uh, to have an agreement with a third party university that would offer credit for those courses. So pretty cool. And a lot of people go, wow, I could get a bachelor's degree for under $30,000. In the US, that's very meaningful. In Europe, less so. I understand the difference between uh, the two economies, but it's an interesting construct. So what we saw as we went into the COVID era, uh, era was on campus learning uh, about 98% uh, on campus and 2% digital. I don't know if you've seen the latest uh, data and statistics on this, but they're out there and 2% of higher learning is digital today. That's a phenomenally small amount. And then we came to COVID in uh, spring of 2020 and schools were forced to go 100% online. And at that point, learners and employers started to have epiphanies and they're the epiphanies that are gonna change what happens worldwide. The other thing that changed was how do universities look at the opportunity to create that type of learning? And in this case, there are some very serious problems that need to be addressed right away. One of them was speed to market. How do I as a university create a quality online course that fast when yesterday we told everybody go home? And because of that, edX and others have done this too, created a online catalog of courses from the world's top universities, about 120 of them, and any university in the world was welcome to order as many seats as they want with those courses and give them to their students and give credit to them. An instant fix to a big problem that would have been uh, both timely and costly, and they could get right to business. Also, for the thousands of schools that took these courses and used them, this was their first time at actually using online learning in a wide array across the campus. And so there were many lessons that were being learned. Sometimes they were doing things asynchronously. Sometimes they were doing things synchronously. Next slide, please. So what did we see in terms of traffic? Is it relevant or is it irrelevant? In this case, we have seen on edX with 38 million learners, a 10 times increase in new registered learners. Fascinating. So for you, in terms of numbers, we would typically do at edX 5 million new registrations per year. 5 million a year. Starting in April 2020, 5 million a month. Now, one of the things that we know for a movement to get started, there needs to be widespread awareness that the movement even exists. And for most of the planet, the idea that these courses were there 
just was invisible. Even though we may have 38 million learners, there are 7 billion people on this planet. So we're not touching even a small fraction of the number that we need to as educators worldwide. Next slide. So it harkens us back to a time in 2012, which we called the year of the MOOC. And uh, for those of you that know Anand Agarwal, the very first course we created on edX was his um, his MIT circuits course 6002X. It's a super famous course. You have to take it if you're going to go in the engineering school at MIT and you have to pass it. And it's a tough course. And uh, we didn't know if edX would be successful or not, but we opened it for registration and we figured if we have 5,000 people, then that's a hit, we'll keep going. We had a quarter of a million people sign up. We had 370,000 people register for that course by the time we went open live for the course itself. And I think out of the first 250,000 in the cohort, we graduated about, I think, 40,000 or so. And people looked at us and said, well, that's not very good. You got uh, a quarter million people, only 40,000 people graduated. Well, Anant would have had to teach two semesters for 40 years in order to graduate that many people. And he did it in six months. So a new era was born of awareness that the throughput we can do by changing what we think about how we do things on campus to include digital vastly expands the audience that can take part of this. So what happens now in 2020, if you look at that little headline on the left, students are stacking credentials and route to a degree. And this is another very important point if we think about what's going to happen 30 years from now, and it's something that we propagate. Next slide, please. The first thing that uh, I want to share about that is that if you were to take uh, yourself to a four-year university and then not complete, as 50% do, you are considered in our world a failure. So you went to school, you dropped out. What do you want, a reward for that? In fact, if you think about the people that are in school now and how they've grown up with a computer in their hands since they were eight years old and the way that they've been gamified to look at everything that they're going to pay attention to, we need to pay attention to that at the university level too. It's ridiculous for us to say they fail. It's more important for us to say along the way, this path to four years, you continue to collect certificates and these can be issued by the university. I'm not talking about just going to online places like edX to take courses, but the university themselves is going to have to find a way to help the students celebrate all of the accomplishments they have as they move through this journey, because for many of them, they're not going to finish, but they will have enough credentials to get a job and they may need a job during the time that they're getting their education anyways. So it's a whole different mindset about why you go to school and what the path to completion looks like. By the way, we also have found out that this helps people complete and move on when they're collecting tokens along the way that demonstrate the acumen that they're uh, gaining. One of the interesting things that I'll harken back to, uh, to our early days, and I think it's great to be able to do this in 2021 when we can look back and say some of the things we thought eight or nine years ago, are they predecessors of what happened in 2020? Are they predictors of what will happen 30 years from now? I think maybe they are. So from a campus perspective, San Jose State University, some of you may be familiar with this story. San Jose State University had a 60% 60 uh, completion rate on their circuits course, which was required as well in order to move forward in engineering. In the California state system, you can fail a course three times and take it for no additional charge. So a course may be hard and people may fail, but the problem is I'm not freeing up any seats and that's a death knell to a university. We need people to pass those courses and a fail rate that was 41% was not acceptable. So we said, let's do an experiment. Let's take the circuits course and then provide that in the classroom from the world's top professor at circuits that you're gonna be able to get a course from, and that's a nonce course, all the different assessment types, the discussion forums, et cetera. And you as the professor will work as the guide on the side with those students. You'll do uh, a, a case study, you'll do question and answer, you'll do problems that are specific to the course, you'll give the exam in the class. The first time we did this, the fail rate dropped from 41% to 9%. Amazing. Did it four more times, same professor. The fail rate continued to decrease to uh, the fourth running of the course. Only 2% of the people failed the course. So an amazing understanding that starts to happen that 
if you use this type of learning in a hybrid setting where the professor can be more actively engaged rather than a lecturer in a hybrid way, we get far better results. And San Jose State University is a, is a um, state school. The, the learners come from diverse backgrounds. It's a place where uh, you would expect minorities and, and women to come to, but kind of avoid STEM. And if they get into STEM, you know, be discouraged by the results of that. And here we had an explosion of people if you could change slides, that came from all walks of life that could ses successfully complete those courses. Next slide, please. Lee, uh, according to the time schedule, we have about five minutes left of your speaking. Great. Well, we definitely don't need to do all the slides, but I think we're getting the story across. Um, we've done the same experiment at MIT and found that the results for people that were taking their courses entirely online in this subject uh, and those that uh, uh, took them into class had similar pass rates as well, so that was excellent. Next slide. So, four major shifts for the future of learning over the next 30 years. One is online, online lifelong learning. Next. This is the survey that we did, and the most interesting number there for me is the 45%. They're more likely to enroll in online course to improve their career prospects. Why? Well, there's been a shift. Employers are now accepting certificates. Employers are talking to learners and they're talking to edX and they're saying, I want to farm those people that have certificates in data science or electrical engineering or Mackey. And we obviously don't have a way for them to do that, but I think that is probably some part of the future where people connect learners with certificates and credentials to employers that want jobs. But the cool news about it is that the employers are willing to concede that a four-year degree is necessary. Therefore, the learner should have a lifelong relationship with their university who could continue to offer them courses, asynchronous, hybrid, or synchronous through the rest of their lives. So when blockchain becomes a thing, or AI becomes a thing, or crypto becomes a thing, all of them can get the adjacent knowledge that they need in order to stay job relevant. Next. What we've seen here uh, is interesting in terms of who's taking the courses and why. And 25% are upskilling their current job. I'm a university. I'm thinking about who my population is. I'm always going to be able to fill the seats on campus. That 25%, that is a huge expansion of your enrolled paying customer base over time that would say, you know what, as long as you can offer these courses, I can take them for a certificate. I can take them at my pace because we're unbundling education. We have to unbundle time, we have to unbundle access, and we have to unbundle cost. And that's the secret to what the next 30 years will be all about. I can find my own learning pathway, I can get to the end that I need, and I can satisfy the need of an employer for me to have a certain set of knowledge. Next. Shift to shorter modular programs. Next. Um, as the pace of change accelerates, the learners need the courses, but they need them faster because there's not enough time for them to take and complete college courses at a semester basis. These are the high impact areas that they're looking for. Next. Uh, blended learning on campus, we talked about a little bit, but I think that 30 year perspective is here now. We have to find a way to allow students that typically would be pigeonholed into one school or another on a campus, design their own curriculum. So I have an MBA, I also wanted to get a uh, micro masters or a credential in uh, microbiology because that's the field I'm interested in. I'm going to be easily able to do that in the new normal. Next. So 30 years out, this is what we think, and I think that we're already approaching that today. If you look at September 21 and then August 2025, we think that we normalize at about 60% on campus and 40% online for your standard uh, campus student. It makes a lot of sense. It expands the seat capacity. It lowers the cost of delivery. It allows for hybrid careers in addition to hybrid learning and gives the professor a chance to let the student pick up the lecture material at the time and place that they want. Next slide. And this is a story from uh, one of the faculty at San Jose that talks about this transition, which is incredibly important. You and I have just talked about that, so we can go to the last one. Next slide. Shift to soft skills and power skills. I'd like you to go to the next slide after this because I think this follows up on a point that uh, you were bringing up at the beginning of this conversation. Next slide, please. 
Before COVID, the top 15 courses we took looked like this. They were in computer science and data and machine learning. Out of all the 3,600 courses, these are the ones that get the most attention. After COVID broke, in the top 15 courses, we now saw leadership, communication, emotional intelligence, creative problem solving, living in a world of screens, working in remote groups, all of these as credentials that signal that there is a new normal coming that we have to think about and apply ourselves to. It's amazing employers want them to take these skills, the students want to take these skills, and as educators, I think it's our place to make sure that those skills are available to them and part of the curriculum. Next slide is the last one. It's kind of just a thank you. New normal is a good thing. I appreciate you being patient with me and taking the time to let me speak to you today. I'll hand you back the ball. Thank you very much, Lee. Very interesting. And, and this is a, a lot of things that you have introduced that we can discuss later on the, on the Q&A. Uh, and I mean, all of us have, have experienced this transition that you have on your slides. Uh, we continue now with the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, it's uh, Bill Rouse. Uh, he is a research professor in the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And he has a long experience uh, of teaching and learning, and uh, he will talk a little bit about uh, trends and investment strategies and implications in different domains. Uh, so, please, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk to uh, the group. I. Uh, I don't see my slides at all, but I, I have a copy here, so I will uh, go from there. Uh, go to slide two, please. Uh, it says four trends. I'm going to talk about uh, these trends here, high quality online offerings, which you just learned a lot about uh, from our, our previous keynote speaker. Then we're going to talk about advanced interactive technology, advanced knowledge management and process modeling and re-engineering. So if you can go to the next slide, which is my last slide, uh, then that will be uh, pretty important for everybody to be able to see that slide, because I'm going to talk through the rows of this uh, table. I'm very interested in determining how the technology is going to differentially affect uh, different disciplines, engineering, medicine, and humanities. Uh, high quality online offerings, that's the row I'm looking at right now. Uh, that's already very evident as, as we see uh, the high quality offerings with demonstrations, group discussions have been common in engineering. Uh, I'll, I'll cite because I, I was a faculty member at Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech's master's degree in online master's degree in computer science has 10,000 students enrolled. The total cost for this master's degree is $7,000, but that shows an interesting point. In medicine, there's some other things that we would like to uh, be able to uh, accomplish besides uh, what we see in engineering. Uh, virtual classrooms for both lectures and small group discussions, uh, including the art of clinical reasoning and actual rounds on patients virtually. So in other words, medical students can actually interact with patients that have various morbidities and uh, that they may not even have in their local area or in their local hospital. Uh, humanities, uh, high quality virtual materials selected from pre-industrial civilizations representing uh, different parts of the world. Uh, now, one of the interesting things in this row and all the others is that much of the investment has happened in engineering already and somewhat in medicine, but humanities has been underinvested in but uh, that that is going to change as the, the technologies mature. The second row, advanced interactive technology to support experiences, demonstrations, experience. Uh, that's happening in engineering, computational laboratories for every engineering discipline, uh, remote access to hardware, robots, powertrains, electronics. Uh, we're seeing uh, in medicine AI patient simulators so students can experience any disease and morbidity despite no current patient uh, having it. 
including all types of personalities and even disabilities not associated with the disease and morbidity. So the, the, the students in medical school can experience a much broader range of patients. Uh, within humanities, augmented reality-based interactions with art, history, geography, culture, to enable students to experience other times, places, and cultures, not just hear about them, not just read about them, but actually experience it. And these technologies are already available, just not widespread yet. Advanced technology for accessing data, information, and knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> with content aggregation, text analytics, and machine learning, we can access and interpret millions of published articles across the breadth of engineering and science. Uh, I had a recent experience where I used an AI-based platform, and I was able to read 250 medical research articles and summarize them in six hours. The reason it happened is I wasn't doing the reading. The AI was and was pointing out to me the key insights that I needed to pay attention to. Very powerful. Uh, content aggregation in um, and medicine and text analysts can work as well. And then uh, for the humanities, easily accessible databases of texts, material culture, artifacts, et cetera. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this row is that you can easily imagine a student having a cognitive assistant, an AI-based cognitive assistant that helps it to uh, help the student to learn and access materials and why couldn't that cognitive assistant continue throughout the student's uh, matriculation and then continue after and actually go to work with the student as they're now an employee? And the cognitive assistant would know everything that the student has taken and be able to provide relevant cues to get back to that information and also be able to note when the content that they have is out of date and they need to go back online and get an update. Uh, the final row is process modeling and re-engineering across the institution. Uh, this is a matter of really understanding uh, the flow of students through each kind, each curriculum, and each uh, uh, content module. Uh, and we could have enormous efficiencies in this. I mean, the reason that Georgia Tech can give a whole degree for $7,000 is because they've really thought through the processes and really invested in the efficiency of those processes. Um, what this is going to mean is that things are going to change substantially. Even the, even the whole notion of a course, why are things organized by courses? I tried at Georgia Tech to uh, organize things by modules. And finally, the registrar turned me down and said, you can't, you have to do it by courses, not by modules, because our IT system can't handle it for the, for the billing and the, and the financial part of it. Oh, that's ridiculous that, that we have to put up with things like that. And I think the way content is packaged and delivered is going to be uh, more in modules, just like our previous speaker said. And to do this right, we're going to have to do the process modeling and re-engineering and make the university a lot more efficient. Now, what does this mean, all this advanced technology, what does it mean for the full range of students? Are we gonna have one class of people that have cognitive assistance and other people who don't even have bandwidth for connectivity? Or we're gonna have to figure out how to provide access to everybody. One of the ways we can do that is by making the cost of education much less expensive by scaling it, by using technology to uh, create the efficiencies we need. I think it's going to be an exciting future. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to having my cognitive assistant uh, to be able to access content and, and, and digest it and retrieve it, et cetera. And I think everybody will benefit from that. Now, this may seem like pie in the sky, but we're talking about 30 years from now. Think about what it was like 30 years ago, and you see how dramatically things have changed. And I think the next 30 years will be dramatic as well. And the cost equation will be such that we'll be able to provide access to these capabilities to everybody. Thank you very much. OK, let me <clears throat> introduce the next speaker. Um, and the next speaker is Leah Jamison. Leah is the Ransberg Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University where she is also the Dean Emerita of the College of Engineering. 
Leah is the co-founder and past director of the Engineering Projects in Computer in Community Service, EPICS, for which he was a co-recipient of the Gordon Prize. The talk of Leah's, uh, the title of Leah's talk is on progress in increasing diversity, inclusion, and equity in engineering education. Leah. Thank you, Jim, and I'm happy to be here. And thank you to Bill for providing um, literally the perfect um, segue to my next slide, which is, there we go. Um, which, um, because in fact, I am going to start by looking not only 30 years back, but um, a, fair before, a fair about further back than that. Um, to think about 2050, I'm gonna start by looking at engineering education through the lens of major epics and turning points, um, going from preparation for a trade to emphasis on engineering science following World War II, a swing of the pendulum in the 1990s from engineering science to engineering design, and emphasis on the development of professional skills, um, continuing growth ex of experiential education and um, far more work being done in active learning. And then, as we heard from Lee um, in the early 2010s, explosive um, introduction and expansion of online learning enabled by technology and the year of the MOOCs. And I would say reflecting on what we've heard the past two days, as we look to education in 2050, built on capabilities created by blazingly fast communications, massive data collection and analysis capabilities, machine learning and AI. In the past year and a half, nope, we, no, yes. In the past year and a half, we have um, seen a massive, what I would call a forced migration to virtual education, online, place independent, remote. And so from this perspective of epics in engineering education, is COVID-19 in fact going to be a turning point in engineering education? And if so, how should it shape our thinking about learning and teaching 30 years from now? So I'm going to draw on presentations from a colloquium held last November at a, a virtual colloquium on the global start of state of the art in engineering education. It was hosted by the University College London. Um, and there were some obvious disruptions for campus-based institutions, and these included students' loss of access to dedicated learning and study spaces and hands-on labs. Campuses closed, students were sent home. Loss of experiential education opportunities, which often include research, community-based projects, study abroad, and are thought of as very much hands-on experiences. And more broadly, um, the student experience and the importance of being a part of a community. But there were also opportunities, um, and in the academic sense, opportunities to improve online education, including labs, um, based on research with massive data emerging to, on which to base some of these changes to develop student leaders and teams virtually against the intuition, but for the virtual world, world ahead, to discover virtual global experiences where possible, were possible and um, to the university's vast relief, cost effective. And also some qualitatively different opportunities, um, heightened awareness of inclusion and privilege. Some students, because of personal circumstances, had very different access, responsibilities, and challenges, leading to faculty being called on to pay attention to the individual circumstances and more broadly to the students' well being, taking us out of our comfort zones. And a realization, I would say, a discovery on both sides that both students and faculty are human. Um, that students saw faculty struggling in uncharted, uncharted space, and there have been increasing conversations about whole person education, 
including attention to mental health and well-being, and the importance of networking, mentoring, and community building for both students and faculty. And these later insights might, in fact, have the greatest potential for ethical change in engineering education with COVID as a turning point. So I'm going to turn to the lenses of diversity, equity, inclusion, and the digital divide, starting with the digital divide. Um, and the graphic on the left is from a May, May 2020 Cambridge report. I think it speaks for itself. The map on the right shows US counties in which three quarters or more of the users are using the internet at download speeds less than 20, 25 megabits per second, that is below broadband speeds. And the broadband data tells two stories. One is a failure. The red blocks in that map represent over half of the counties in the United States. But it's also a story of success because these counties represent only nine and a half percent of the population. Ninety one and a half percent of us are, are in areas where we use broadly broadband wirelessly regularly. But through our students in the past year and a half, we saw far more clearly than before that the digital divide is real and that it has an impact on education at all levels. An impact on education means impact on the future. Through the lenses of diversity, equity, and inclusion, COVID shone new light on some of the consequences of being the minority population, of not setting the norms for the academic and engineering cultures in which we live, when education and life are disrupted. And I'll come back to that. Where are we with respect to diversity? Um, in the US from 20, 2008 to 2018, the percent of engineering bachelor's degrees earned by black students went from 4.7% to 4.3%. Between 1996 and 2019, the number of US women graduating with an undergrad degree in engineering has increased from 18% to 22%. This is an annual increase of under 0.9% over a period of 23 years. We spent a lot of the past two days talking about the important role that AI will play in 2050. But wireless, wired, wired magazine has reported that just 12% of machine learning researchers are women. And a New York Times article from three days ago reported that 10% of workers in computing in San Francisco and Silicon Valley are black. 12 and a third percent of all engineers are women in the UK. And the list of countries in which women continue to be significantly underrepresented is long, including Italy, France, Germany, Ireland, Switzerland, Canada, Israel, Japan, Korea, and more. And just over 6% of UK domicile students enrolled into STEM related subjects at UK universities are black. So I would suggest that to think about the changes technology will bring to learning and teaching, we also need to think about progress or not in diversity, equity, and inclusion. 1996. Uh, Lina, we only have two yeah. minutes left. Okay. Um, Almost done. Um, red in the chart marks the enactment of the Telecommunications Act in the US. Um, the blue shows most recent census data. Between those two endpoints, the percent of US population in counties primarily using broadband grew, grew from essentially nothing to 91%. Over the same period, percent of racial and ethnic groups, Black and African American, Hispanic, American Indian, Alaskan Native, grew from 24 to 36 percent of the U.S. population. Over the same period, these racial and ethnic groups, as a percent of engineering graduates, grew from 11 to 12 percent. And one snapshot of what upper what underrepresented groups have experienced during the pandemic. Um, Kim comes from re recent report from the U.S. National Academies of Engineering. Early indications, women, especially women of color, have seen disproportionate 
helps to flip the slide. I've seen disproportionate loss of work like boundaries, loss of mentoring, networking, community building, reduced productivity, reduced hours because of caregiving and educating at home, stress induced insomnia, anxiety, depression, and other effects. And so I'm going to cl close coming back to the future and filling in the chart with an aspirational vision of engineering education in 30 years with COVID-19 as a definite turning point that inspires us to take full advantage of the spotlight that the pandemic is shining on the things we have not succeeded in accomplishing to date. That in addition uh, to having moved to online, modular, personalized, blended, inter interactive, immersive and global education and the integrated AI-driven human machine learning environments, engineering education will also be diverse, equitable, and inclusive. It will be attentive to mental health, the importance of network and community building, and the whole person, whether that person is a student or an educator. And perhaps most important, it will be increasingly resilient to future disruptions, um, be they from new novel infectious diseases, climate-related fires and floods, economic volatility, social unrest, and that based on lessons learned from COVID-19, in 2050, engineering education is robust across all of these aspirational pedagogical, societal, and human dimensions. And I would say that this would be a worthy beginning for a new epic in engineering education. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Leah. Now let me introduce last speaker, Manu Kapoor. He holds a professorship for learning sciences in higher education at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. And without further ado, he'll talk about the future of learning as, as the previous speakers have also. Kapoor. Thank you, James, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Manu, and I'm going to talk about the future of learning. Very quickly, let me introduce you to the context and the, the work that I do before I uh, run into the three trends that I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah. So um, at, uh, at ETH Zurich, I direct the Future Learning Initiative. It's an interdisciplinary uh, research that's shaping the future of learning. And we look at both basic fundamental research in, the, uh, in terms of neural mechanisms or the cognitive mechanisms or the embodiment. I'll talk more about that later on, uh, the social mechanisms and the cultural mechanisms. So looking at learning as a complex phenomena across multiple levels, doing re really basic fundamental research on learning. And then at the same time, we try to translate this basic research into applications and interventions in schools and the higher education context. So that's the kind of, so I'm a learning scientist interested in fundamental mechanisms of learning and how to translate them into building applications for uh, schools and higher education context. What I'm going to talk about is this initiative uh, is an interdisciplinary initiative. So the, the uh, basic commitment here is, uh, you know, what Leah also mentioned is on diversity, not quite completely, but at least in terms of gender. Um, and we have uh, diversity in terms of the domains as well, because the idea is that learning uh, of the future of learning will be shaped not alone by cognitive scientists or learning scientists, but the involvement of all STEM professors, um, computer science, mathematicians, biologists, architects, and so on and so forth. So it's a highly interdisciplinary project, university-wide, uh, and a number of projects are going on. I'm going to focus on three of them, uh, three trends that we're looking at, and I represent them as equations here. Whoops, uh, I've been too many. Okay, so first thing I'm going to talk about is the new models of learning. There are new models of learning that are taking a departure from the past models, the traditional models of instruction, which uh, unfortunately somewhat underpin, some of, underpin still some of our teaching and learning, whether it's online or offline. Uh, one of the new models of learning that I've been looking, looking at is called productive failure, and I'll quickly describe that. A second trend would be the new models of learning together with artificial intelligence will allow us to uh, create systems that achieve personalization at scale. Some of the speakers have already mentioned that, but here we're trying to uh, combine artificial intelligence with new models of learning that are at the cutting edge of research on learning itself. And a third trend 
is the transduction or the reciprocity between action and cognition, which is opening up new ways of encoding information. This is a movement called embodied learning, um, and it's showing dramatic effects in uh, how we think about cognition and learning and how we design for it. So first, let's look at the new models of learning by looking at what is the prevailing or historically has been the prevailing model of learning, which is direct instruction, which you see on the left of the screen. And this is basically a success-based activation model. So if you're a novice and if you don't know a concept or an idea or a skill, the idea is let me teach you exactly what to do and how to do it as clearly and engagingly as possible. And then you can practice that skill or concept in problem solving. So it's instruction followed by problem solving and it's a success-based activation. It's not, it's not a bad model, but the uh, last 20 years of research has shown that a failure-based activation model, which turns it on its head and says, well, instead of starting with immediate instruction or a video or, a, or something like that um, to a novice, let's engage novices intentionally in failure-based activation through problem solving that are carefully curated and designed so that they, although they fail to solve these problems, they prepare them to learn from instruction later. So initial failure can be turned into powerful deep learning using productive failure. And that's the theory that I've been working on, uh, which represents one of the newer models of learning that are showing breakthrough effects. It's not just me, it's also uh, this, uh, in the past 20 years uh, or so, the work has been replicated and reproduced around the world and extended around the world. In a, in a recent meta-analysis of 166 such comparisons, we found that productive failure outperforms the traditional models of learning quite substantially and robustly. So just to give you the figures are there, but just to give you an example or a benchmark for comparison, if you can take, you know, uh, if you spend uh, one year with a good teacher, uh, suppose you gain one unit as shown, uh, productive failure can give you up to three times that amount in terms of the effect. So we're not talking about incremental uh, change in how we design these learning environments. We're talking about breakthrough effects. Um, and we want to take these breakthrough effects, which brings me to the next point, and combine them with artificial intelligence. And then, oops, it keeps going forward. Yeah. Uh, combine them with artificial intelligence technologies to achieve personalization at scale. Because one of the reasons why productive failure works, or these new models of learning work so well, because they adapt to the learner. Uh, they're constantly building the learner model, trying to activate their knowledge, making everybody know what the learner knows, and then adapt to that and build future instruction or scaffolds based on that. Um, and so if you can marry productive failure with technologies such as artificial intelligence, um, what we hope to see is personalization at scale in the next uh, 10 to 20 years even. And here, when I speak of AI, I'm not talking about narrow AI, which is you know, the kind of AI we're currently used to. So you know, AI can recognize faces, can recognize patterns, can mark essays, can, and so on and so forth, can play games that are well-structured and rule-based. All that is very nice and good, but to achieve the kind of personalization that we are targeting, it will require advances, fundamental advances in general AI, and that will help us achieve personalization at scale. So that's the second trend. The third is what I call embodiment. And this is the idea, especially in the Western canon, the mind has been very has been dealt with very separate, differently and separately from the body. It's the disembodied mind. So theories of the mind have been rather disembodied. Uh, whereas now we're finding increasing evidence, both from biology, physiology, and learning and cognition, that there's strong coupling between the mind and the body. Um, why I show you this glass of champagne on the right is simply to remind myself that it's a beautiful afternoon here in Zurich and I should be on my terrace drinking that. But to make a point here in this presentation that right now, as you're looking at this uh, glass of champagne, from a neuroscientific standpoint, a neuroimaging standpoint, your motor circuits are already firing as though you're reaching out to grasp this glass of champagne, even though there is quite obviously no overt action you're taking place. Simple idea that we encode information, not just visually or perceptually, but also as simulations and action. You know, if action is encoded as part of our construction of meaning, then that opens up a very a uh, new line of inquiry. It's not new, it's been around for a while, but it's really uh, accelerating now. And the questions here that we are investigating is how does action influence cognition? And if there's a strong coupling, which you're finding there's a strong coupling in how we move, how we, how we uh, post our postures, how we use our hands and gestures, if there's a strong coupling between the action and cognition, then the question could be from a teaching and learning standpoint, the question could be turned into, well, if that's the case, instead or in addition to learning and uh, learning through listening and seeing and writing, 
can we learn by moving better? And by moving, I don't mean simply the physiological or the exercise or health benefits of moving, but really moving in ways that help us understand or develop intuitions about the deep structure of a concept or an idea. Um, and we're finding significant effects or, uh, and studies in this area. And then we can extend this further and ask, well, if you want to personalize learning, why personalize learning only based on cognitive or affective information? Why not uh, personalize learning more holistically by combining physiological motor mechanisms as well as cognitive and uh, socio-affective mechanisms as well? And this is an area that's going to make fundamental, of course, as a scientist, I'm interested in fundamental research. And this is an area, embodied learning, that's going to build bring about uh, you know, several fields together, the learning sciences, health and aging, lifelong learning, computer science, neuroscience, robotics, and of course the STEM disciplines. So uh, to end with the final equation, and that is that let's take new models of learning such as productive failure, marry them with general artificial, advances in general artificial intelligence, and combine that with embodiment or the embodied cognition and learning to build not just personalization at scale, but embodied personalization at scale. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Um, so, Johan, do you have a list of questions that you can see? Yes, we have a few questions uh, and we, uh, we uh, you and I prepared some before as well. And I think, I mean, our speakers have covered a broad range of, of um, areas and perspectives of, uh, of the future teaching and learning and maybe we should uh, uh, have them all in, in the picture. Thank you very much. And I think because before we started the, the session, uh, you had this poll uh, about the inclusion and, and the majority of the uh, people that attend now said that it will be more inclusive, but you heard both from, from um, uh, Bill Rouse and Leah Jameson that there is some challenges with that. Can we start with that that perspective? Maybe, Leah, you can just uh, reflect on what the audience believe it's, it will be more inclusive, but you said you had some uh, perspectives on that. So, it, I mean, it, it, it's been clear for probably decades that inclusiveness is important and that education in particular, education is a stepping stone to, to, to futures. And so the, the fact that there has been in many fields of engineering, um, very little progress on diversity, um, both racial and ethnic diversity and gender diversity, number of women, um, is, is critical challenge. And so, you know, I, I think that um, setting a goal Part, part, part of progress is, is setting a goal. And so for me, saying, you know what, we're going to be there by 2050. I, I was on a board of directors many years ago that had said 50-50 by 2020 with respect to women. We obviously didn't hit that mark by anywhere near close. But I think that a lot of the shortcomings, a lot of the lack of progress hasn't been because we don't know what to do. I think there's some things that are incredibly hard, but I, I think there's some practical things. I think with COVID, take it as an opportunity and don't go back to normal. Understand how did COVID affect women students, first generation students, minority students most drastically, and don't go back to those things and take it as an opportunity. Um, there have been recent National Academies reports in the U.S., one called Promising Practices, um, focused on gender um, diversity and things that we knew how to do and some places were starting to do, but they got lost because of the pace of decision making and the, the almost panicked responses to COVID. Um, there are examples of the role of leadership, things like equity-minded leadership, um, which some institutions practice, but a lot don't. But I, and I think in practical terms, um, the areas where we've seen huge progress um, for a very long time is, you know, where's the support for this? How do you elevate it to actually a very high priority for the next 30 years? And I would say that um, government industry, philanthropic investments, um, proportionate to the gaps, um, the part of me that says this is all great, but do we really have a chance? Um, I mean, we've seen in the U.S. systemic racism and 
there are a lot of things embedded in our culture. But I also would say that academia is a good place to try to make the progress because that'll feed industry and eventually we'll get there. Good. Uh, anyone else from the panel that have some reflections on this first? Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have yeah. a couple of comments. Um, so in the U.S., 16% of the students who graduate from high school are STEM ready. They've taken the right courses to go into a STEM major. The uh, Most of them do major in STEM. About half of them drop out. They change majors. So the first thing we could do is to support students so they don't drop out, although there may be a variety of reasons for that. But then we should look at the 16%. Why is only 16% of the students STEM ready? The problem is in K through 12, it's not at the university. And if you look at the university, we've got an ongoing study of this. You look at K through 12 across the country, it's very uneven in terms of the quality of, of education. Uh, the way to recruit women, for example, has been studied extensively by, by the National Academy of Engineering in a program called Engineer Girl. And that program has been going on for 20 years now. It's been very successful. Uh, one of the findings is that if you want to encourage a woman to go into STEM, you need to contact them in middle school, not high school. High school's too late. Okay, so you need to interact with them in, in, in middle school. Another interesting finding we, we've, we've dug up in all of this research if a student finishes third grade without achieving third grade reading level, chances are they'll never go to college. Uh, so we need to be looking at the whole lifespan of the student, not just trying to fix it once they get to higher education. Certainly there are things we can do in higher education to do, to do better, but we've got a whole pipeline that we need to pay attention to. Thank you. I, I think I saw uh, Lee's uh, hand and also Manu. Uh, we had a we have another question on this topic in the chat, and it's it's uh, like this: Could the government play a larger role in uh, in the challenges for equity in education, like community college uh, free, make broadband a public utility, general investment in more public in good instead of private tech? So, if you continue with with this, first Lee and then Manu. <clears throat> Yeah, let me let me add to Bill's comments. First of all, I 100% agree with Bill. And I can tell you right now that the answer is in middle school, secondary schools, way before they get to college. I can also guarantee you that if we survey all the students that are coming out of 12th grade in high school and ask them, what does an engineer do? That 95% of them will say, no idea. And that's a sin that they don't know this when they're coming up. And we're not teaching anything about uh, engineering and thinking that physics and bio and calc are all they need to know to understand where the future is, especially for women, we've made a huge tactical error. The second part, I think that and this is the part where government could play a role too. I don't understand why we don't have very specific scholarships to in, uh, enhance the opportunity for women and minorities to come into our engineering programs and say, yeah, you looking for a way to get in school? If you're interested in this, we will subsidize you until we have enough of them in the community to spread the word of mouth among each other that, hey, this is a great career. You can actually do it. It's not as hard as you think. And the, the career opportunities and the pay is exceptional compared to the low hourly rate wage jobs that you're going to qualify for if you ignore what I'm telling you. The community has to do that, but we have to seed it. Thank you. Uh, Manu. Um Yes, thank you. So I, I, I can't emphasize more that, yes, the, the, the inequities start actually very early, even before middle school. If you look at stereotype research, uh, whether it's gender or otherwise, actually it starts as early as two, second grade, first and second grade, where you know girls are already believing that math is for boys, and as do the maths do. So I think we need to go even further back. Uh, at least that's what the science, developmental science, is suggesting. Uh, the second thing I want to make is inequities are perpetuated by the current models of learning. And this is a very clear, I mean, the, it, the current model of direct instruction, the rich get richer. The person who knows more, just a little bit more coming into the first grade benefits more. Just That's how the cognitive architecture works. Benefits more from the same lecture, same information, same content than somebody who knows slightly less. Now bootstrap that many, many years over time. Current models of instruction actually perpetuate these inequities and we need to disrupt those as well so that we can you know, bring about some equity in, in, in the design of learning and instruction. 
Uh, very clear uh, ideas, both from you and, and, and from Lee, I think. Uh, uh, any more comments on this topic of, of this inclusion and divide? Um, so the one other um, thing that hasn't come up, and, and I absolutely agree with everything that's been said, the younger that the work starts, the, the more impact it's going to have, and it's really going to be necessary. The one thing I would add is that there are also, um, was the National Academies report from 2008 called Changing the Conversation. And um, the, 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 the top line message from that was that disproportionately, both girls and of all ages, starting from first grade up through college and even beyond in the workforce, so girls and women, and also um, people, from, especially students from underrepresented groups, resonated with the messaging and an understanding of engineering that engineering makes a difference in the world. Um, and so framing it in terms of of relevance to people, of relevance to society, um, was a far better starting point than the stereotypic, we're going to build the fastest car, we're going to build the fastest rocket. Um, and that this was even the probably clearest the younger the children were. Interesting. Thank you. I, I continue with another topic. It's two two questions from the audience that is a little bit interrelated. One is more specific to leave, maybe. Uh, that's the first one is, what is the bottleneck for rollout uh, the edX type of learning in UK, Europe and globally? Acknowledgement by employers of, of the credits, legislation and recognition by politicians and laws or something else? Uh, and the second question is a little bit connected to that is do university leaders have an appetite for furthering the use of blended and online learning or are most prioritizing the return to a campus-based experience? Who want to start with this though to... Maybe you should start, uh, Lee, with the, with the first question. Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things. One of them is related to the employer side and skills taxonomy. And that's one that's being solved right now. I'm very excited by the work that I'm seeing from multiple organizations that are federally funded in the US and then the WEF uh, for worldwide that will allow someone to look at a course and go, these are the skills you get that matches what we're looking for in terms of curriculum. So that's a great move. Uh, the second part I think is as much governmental as it is university, but I think if we could get universities to begin the process of letting students become aware of these courses where there are adjacencies to the programs they're taking that will make them more relevant in terms of careers and that would allow them to get credit at the university level for those courses because they're coming from they're the same courses over on campus by really rigorous universities then we could start a chain reaction of people being able to design the future they want at a very very low cost to the university and it only improves the capability of the learner to understand the marketplace better and why they're taking what they're taking on campus. Okay, any additional comments to, to Lee's introduction on this question? Yeah, I have, I have one observation. We've been, we've been involved with a study for a while now on the future of work and, and what, if, what jobs are people gonna be doing? And, and the last compilation I've got, I've got, uh, 25 million new jobs, jobs that don't exist now. And uh, by the way, in the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the two fastest growing jobs in the United States are solar, solar panel installer and wind turbine maintainer. Uh, the, the point is we're going to need an increasingly skilled technical workforce. They won't necessarily need to have a bachelor's degree, but they will have to have technical skills and uh, my back of the envelope calculation is we actually need to triple the capacity of community colleges to meet this need. Yeah, the problem with that the community colleges have is lack of qualified instructors to teach at scale all of these great subjects, which is why if we can all share some online resources and say, look, these are the best ones. Now add a professor on top of that to cover how you apply the knowledge. We don't have to worry about them inventing programs that all are equivalent in terms of rigor and status and credential because that's that's the killer in this deal. Uh, I, I come, yeah, uh, please, Leah. 
yeah, um, the, the one I would add one point to the question about the um, appetite for online and blended learning, and I and I think the answer is absolutely yes. That um, interestingly, uh, one of the things that has been growing is active learning with more increased understanding that um, lecturing at people is perhaps not the most effective way in the world for for students to learn at any age. Um, and so there's actually been a lot of blended learning going on at universities um, with lectures that are recorded into modules and then more interactive activities when students are in smaller groups and in person. And so I think the fit is actually incredibly good. And, and I think that what the universities have seen is that there were things students did absolutely miss by not being on campus and that students and faculty lost, but that the online was, was actually an incredibly effective tool in um, bringing students up to speed as you, you know, retention rates, but also I think active learning and it, it complements it and, and enables it in really important ways. So I think there's absolutely an appetite. Yep. Thank you. I have a question for Lee. You 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 showed a shift in your uh, courses, the the interest for the more soft skills. Did did the pedagogic change in the courses when you when you provided them uh, in, in this shift? So um, they're designed under the same uh, pedagogic rules that uh, are required in order to be on edX. So I don't think there was a shift as much as there was for the first time, a very interactive opportunity for the learner to not only participate in the class, but to participate with a global population of other students that are taking the course in the discussion forums, which changes the dynamic tremendously because it forces them to relate and, and use in practice some of the things they're picking up on the spot. And we all know that to create that neural collection, that, that neural connection within six minutes or so, it's a great idea to give them an opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you. I have a question to Manu from the or I will start with you. Uh, is there any hard evidence yet on whether new or different models of engineering education generate better or different types of engineers? Yes, there is emerging evidence. Uh, you know, the one of the things that I shared in my um, slides was this meta-analysis of 15 years of research that is um, that's showing that if you change the model of instruction, you change the learning outcomes and you design for deep learning. We are used to, you know, instruction first followed by problem solving. We use failure based activation and that completely changes how people learn. There is a lot of evidence that's coming in um, along these lines. I think Leah also mentioned, uh, alluded to some of that. Uh, not all of it is strictly experimental in a, in a way that was uh, be robust to science, but now there is enough robust evidence that we can say we need to change. The second thing I would say is we're focusing a lot on, at least so far in this conversation, we're focusing a lot on content and skills. It's very instrumental. We are very instrumental in our thinking of uh, people must get jobs, must have a living and so on. And that's all very good. But I think what COVID has also shown that we need to redress the balance between you know, content and emotion and affect. In fact, one of the, uh, in addition to embodiment, one of the areas that's going to grow is the socio-emotional affective component of uh, human learning. So I, I hope we also pay attention to those aspects as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, James, do you have an additional question? Because now I, I think, I, I think one, thing we discussed a little bit before the session in in the in the panel is is the is the, the I mean the divide in mathematics very early on and, and I think Leah you had some some ideas about that and maybe that's something also connected to the whole theme we discussed today I'm sorry, I, I think I missed the salient couple of words at the beginning of, the, of that. The, 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 the importance of, of mathematics, uh, the, uh, that's, a, that's a very early divide, not only this, uh, I mean, you discussed it a little bit before, but you had some ideas when we prepared this session about yeah. the, the importance of mathematics. You know, full, um, you know, full, full, full disclosure is that my bachelor's degree is in mathematics, um, and I shifted to engineering because I wanted to see what I would do with what I was learning. Um, I, you know, I we're talking about very increasingly complex 
solutions to almost every problem we're looking at. And there are certainly parts that come into play most when you're doing the implementation, but the design part, the the, 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 the simulation part, the breakthroughs that are get, going to give you the new foundations for energy, for healthcare, for any of these activities, um, are going to come out of math and science. And so um, I think when the shift happened from um, engineering sciences as ruling the engineering curriculum for many, many almost 50 years, um, the move wasn't to say we don't need it. It was to say that industry was saying we need the professional skills too, and we need the design experience. But um, yeah, in one of the earlier sessions, uh, there was, was some discussion about um, curiosity or investigator-driven research compared to um, more goals-driven research. And, and you know, the, the the case was that we will always need that fundamental underlying, how do you move the basic math ahead? How do you move the basic science? And we need people who can use that and think about it and design real solutions with it. So I, I don't see it ever, ever see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the final question is actually specifically to Manu, and then, then we we are uh, in the end of this session, and, uh, and, and I will give the last word to my colleague James uh, to close, but each one of you can have just a sentence uh, of the key message before we close the session about the future of, of uh, teaching and learning. So Manu, we have uh, this question from, from, um, from the audience. Uh, embodied learning is absolutely the right way to go, but we, uh, we know the cost is high. How do you suggest we can balance the benefits and costs for the integrated model? Yes, thank you for that question. So, yes, the cost is currently high, but as we know with many things, this cost will, and we're talking about 20, 30 years, we're doing the basic science right now, and even in our basic science, uh, the logic of our basic science, we're trying to find the critical levers uh, so that very small changes can influence very big effects. And I think that's the model that we're trying to follow. Uh, even in the productive failure research, we, you know, in one study, we had a seven hour intervention lasting the whole year. Like that's the whole year. And we were able to show a 20% increase in uh, passing rates at examiners. Seven hours investment over the course of the whole year. So uh, I think it's both advancing science to look for critical levers, which will happen anyways. And at the same time, the cost of technology and integration is gonna go down. So that in the next 20, 30 years, um, it will be a non-question, a non-issue. Yeah. Thank you. So before we, you leave the floor, uh, what, what's your final remark on the future of, of teaching and learning before we close this session, Manu? And then we'll, I will go to the rest of the panel for this final comment. Well, a couple of things. A, uh, education suffers from the bandwagon effect. Let's be mindful, all, all leaders, policymakers, let's not jump to the latest bandwagon. I hope that as part of the decisions that are made about teaching and learning and education, that science, the science of cognition and learning will have a much larger role. Second point, the unit of design or the unit of change is not a technology or a pedagogy. The unit of change is culture. We are in the business of changing cultures, and that's the fundamental transformation that we need to make. Thank you. Thank you. Leah, what's your final comment? Um, my final comment is that we we need to be moving towards a future that has truly embraced the idea that that engineering is for the benefit of humanity and that that engineering is done by people who represent the full breadth and spectrum of humanity. And in order to get there, we are going to need education starting as early as possible that includes everyone. Thank you. And Lee, your final remarks. Yeah, I'd like to plus one on what Leah said and then add that there's no reason why right now today we can't take a curriculum of basics of engineering for middle, middle and high school, make that available to the world for free so that we can propagate the seeds that will turn into the engineers you want to have 30 years from now. And uh, that's something that we can undertake as an action item and be happy to think about ways to do that together. But everybody should try to think about what we can do in that regard. We've got the tools. Thank you. And uh, Bill, uh, what's your key message? 
I think we need to look at what we've talked about today in the context of an overarching goal. We need 100% of our population to be healthy, educated, and productive. We need no one left behind. No child, no adult, no one. Okay. Now, people say, how can we possibly afford that? Well, my economic analysis shows that if everybody was healthy, educated, and productive, the revenues that would result will easily pay to achieve that goal. I think we need to be very ambitious. That's a clear, clear, ambitious goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, all, all of you. And I will give the floor now to my colleague James to have the challenge to, to s summarize and, and uh, close this uh, very, very interesting dis discussion. James, are you there? Uh, yeah, Johan. Um, you know, it's a very interesting. We have a, we have a AI system at work. So when you we just had my picture up there, I did not hardly hear you guys. They took away my power and distributed. So, um, so I appreciate you taking over and and doing all the questions and answers. Uh, I just have. I just have one, uh, you know, thank you for the group for uh, participating in this in this segment of the conference. And I look forward to maybe one day actually thanking you in person. All right, bye. So by that, uh, thank you to, to all of you in the panel, to Lee Rubenstein, Bill Rouse, Leah Jameson and Manu Kapu. And with that, we close this session. And I hope we have the, our um, guide in the in the in the um, in the conference to take over now. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you very much. I'm certainly here. That was an absolutely fascinating discussion. I learned so much, and I can't wait for this new world of education to come along. Um, uh, there's a lot of courses I'd love to do in various universities. Um, our last keynote presentation is from one of the keenest observers and practitioners of European research and innovation policy. Minister Manuel Haitor is the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education in Portugal, and he's given us a presentation now. So, Minister, over to you. Good afternoon to you all. Let me certainly uh, start by thanking Cesar and the Royal Academy of Engineering for providing these unique e events to discuss key technologies shaping the future. First, the title is dangerous. And definitely we need to understand that more than ever, we live in times of uncertainty, of increased risk society, and the learning capacity that we can build to address risks obliges us to understand a broad and holistic views of the integration of key technologies and advanced knowledge in all areas of our um, knowledge landscape. So I will not take definitely an approach to um, foster a recipe to all of you. On the other hand, I will try to um, ask for your understanding of the situation we live in. And I would like to start with five lessons we have driven from these uh, COVID times. Over the last year and a half, we have seen many manifestations, many scientists on the daily TV screens, and many politicians addressing science and science advisors. But at this time, I would like to take five issues. First and foremost, we have been able as um, humankind to compress the time that we traditionally have been used to develop a vaccine. And we need to understand that this was made by those which have fundamental knowledge on new processes, which actually have not been considered a good technology two years ago, with or in articulation with disruptive innovators. And this, per se, is a lesson how to address key technologies for future. Our MNA 
was completely taken as, as a secondary issue or process some 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or five years ago. And today we have a vaccine because we have been able, either in Europe through BioNTech or in the United States with Moderna, to really couple the most basic fundamental knowledge of cell th therapies with disruptive innovators. And again, this articulation between fundamental science and um, um, innovation will keep in our minds an alert that we, we really need to foster these joint ventures for the year to come to address not only to address not only the COVID situation, but more broadly, more broadly, the, this area of the, the Anthropocene, which certainly COVID is one of the manifestations of the massive domination of humankind on the planet Earth. And this actually takes to my second lesson, because more and more a learning society is a society which allows everyone to learn more throughout uh, the, uh, their life. And actually, we have been very much developed learning systems focused on, on the youngsters, which we need to keep enlarging, but we have an aging society in most of our countries, which needs to be reskilled and upskilled to face the challenges of the green transitions and making use of the unique opportunities of the digitalization. My third lesson is on the regulatory issues. We have understood over this year and a half how slow and how fast different systems could evolve with innovative breakthroughs from masks to tests to vaccines, and again, we understand that the regulatory framework and the overall administrative burden needs to be simplified to facilitate more and more innovations for an healthy and greener society. And this is a social problem. It is not just a, a question of governments or of organized lobbies. It's a social issue, the um, simplification of the regulatory contexts. My fourth lesson is very much on the social context for digital transition. Contact tracing has become a powerful technology and we have understood in Europe, in the United States and in other parts of the world that in some regions it worked very well, in other regions it, it completely collapsed because the digital transition is a social construct and is, is a social process that needs to be understood. This leads to my last and fifth conclusions, which are lessons that I'd like to take before entering into key technologies, which is very much the social context for open data. Again, we have understood that the increasing privatization of knowledge over the years has blocked in many ways the open access to fundamental knowledge. And therefore, more and more, the use of public repository systems will become a key mark in the development of our science and key technologies. But these five lessons certainly need to bring content on them. And the content can be provided by a number of key technologies if we understand those technologies on the basis of a quite diversified knowledge base in every single knowledge um, um, area. And again, this articulation should always be present because we cannot understand a, a, a simple key technology without the knowledge base behind or in its for, for friends. And if we know that key technology do depend, do depend on basic knowledge, we also know that the advancement of technical systems will bring new scientific problems. Probably among many others, the example of electric mobility is clear shown as. It is dependent these days on the development of a new generation of solid state cells, which we will be able to develop if we control and monitor the atomic deposition of nanoparticles and do understand the basic physics and the advanced materials associated with a new solid state um, cells. And therefore, 
it is not possible to advance in a more sophisticated economic context without a continuous and simultaneous development of a basic science knowledge. But let me address the societal issues which may drive key technologies, and I will again um, include four main areas. First, what we call a NELSI society. A NELSI society and a NELSI systems which are citizen-driven will certainly need to um, be developed in close association with key, key fundamental knowledge in biomolecular engineering, with with um, um, biosciences, but more and more in close articulation with advanced information systems. 60 years after the first paper on artificial in intelligence, we should be proud as humankind today to have the, a, massific a massified approach to artificial e intelligence. And the fusion with the system will be critical. For instance, during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, a major conference on cancer research was organized in the city of Porto, and among other issues, the topic of digital pathology has become central to the development of a new cancer research to facilitate the, the treatment of cancer, of cancer patients. But we also know that digital therapeutics in many areas of cancer, but also mental diseases, has become very critical for an healthy society. And therefore, the fusion of digital systems including artificial intelligence, but also other areas of analytics with the basic biosciences will be critical in the years to come if we, if we want to massify key technologies for an healthy society. The, the, the second area are the key technologies for a safe and secure world. And again, the continuous miniaturization of um, sensors essentially located in low orbit satellites in an approach which is more and more open to new um, to new institutions to startups to research institutions opening to what we call a new space approach will be critical for a secure and um, safe worlds from maritime surveillance to urban mobility or to biodiversity preservation among many others including fire prevention we know today in Europe and elsewhere, that fire prevention will depend more and more on land register and the way we can control the every single centimeter on the planet Earth in a daily basis. And this can only be done if we really adapt space systems um, through high resolution image captured by low orbit satellites with in situ sensors and again coupling with information, um, information systems. But most of our land is still remote areas and to communicate in those remote areas are in the oceans or in forests we need more and more school communications which will only be provided if we accelerate the development of quantum science and quantum technologies. Again, this is also a call for an alert to Europeans. We have developed the basic of quantum science, but we have not been allowed yet to go, um, to go ahead in quantum, uh, in quantum technologies, which will be critical for a, a demassification of a communication and secure systems worldwide, particularly in remote areas densely, low, with low density populations. My third key area of the development is certainly green technologies for a greener society. And more and more we know that the next decade will be heavily dominated by the hydrogen economy. But the hydrogen economy per se will be a completely different economy with a fast change reactions. And we need, we know, to, we need to better understand the beauty of the hydrogen chemistry, which avoids carbon, but brings probably um, other um, uh, 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 oxygen, uh, uh, nitrogen oxides, which 
uh, we uh, really don't understand the full chemistry of hydrogen yet, not only the chemical processes which will allow us to develop a new generation of um, greener electrolyzers and related equipments, and therefore developing the full hydrogen value chain from the basic hydrogen chemistry to the distribution of hydrogen in safe and secure conditions will certainly be an area for controllers, for um, uh, uh, chemistries, but also for the integration of a diversified knowledge base. Again, for the green society, we address hydrogen, but we can only understand it through a full circular um, context for our economies. And circularity has become a key issue during the COVID when we, Europeans, understood that in many areas of our activity we are full dependent of raw materials most of them from a single country, India. And this, again, more than the so-called sovereignty or strategic autonomy of each continent, is a question of greening our industry. The world do not support long value chains in terms of geographic conditions. So we need to shorten our value chains in order to have a greener economy and a greener society. And this calls for a better understanding of advanced materials to be able to develop locally and regionally a full circular economy. Again, this can only be done by bringing together a quite diversified set of the disciplines from chemical engineers to materials material sciences and certainly better dominating the, the understanding of um, um, advanced um, materials. But before the LC society, beyond the safe societies or beyond the greener society, we have understood that more and more we need a fourth critical area of understanding an happier and learning society. And this should call our attention that when we speak about key technologies, we are also speaking about understanding the basic issues for deepening the humanities research, opening up humanities research, and essentially, and essentially avoiding what today has been called by a social burnout, or at least the burnout of those at the age of 30 years old which have passed cons consecutive crises. Understanding the key issues of cognitive sciences which will drive a happier society, which will bring youngsters to the center of our discussion, will be critical because, again, in an aging society, we need to understand the different phases of our cognitive evolution along our age and how in every single age we can contribute for a better world. So key technologies are, are not only artificial intelligence or chemical or the chemistry of hydrogen or the uh, advanced materials of lithium nanoparts for solid state cells. Key technologies are also understanding human being and uh, the way we can build an happier and more inclusive society bringing, therefore, so the social sciences and the humanities also in the center of this the discussion. Actually, these four areas of key technologies shaping the future have very much, have very much framed a series of manifestos which we launched during the Portuguese presidency in quite large collaboration throughout Europe. And I would like to list them, apart from other conclusions of these last six months. We launched the Lisbon Manifesto on Open Humanities Research, essentially to call the attention of humanities scholars for the need to open their unique understanding of the humanities and bring a more inclusive citizen-centered approach to the humanities. We have also launched the Porto Cancer Research Manifesto to essentially provide throughout Europe three types of research infrastructures, 
on translational research, on um, clinical trials and on outcomes research. And in the area of ocean and earth observations, we launched the Azores Declaration along with the whole Atlantic cooperation, pole to pole, east to west of Atlantic, in order to better provide the Atlantic as a, an experimental test bed. And at the same time, we launched the Europe Africa Manifesto on Dirt Observations to better deepen what GEMES Africa has been done over the last years, but really entering into areas of precision agriculture, precision fisheries, or biodiversity prevention. In this concept, actually, it was interesting to bring together European experts and citizens together with, with European parliaments addressing creative industries. And we launched three weeks ago the Lisbon Manifest on citizen-centered, research-driven creative industries in order to go from a global to a local and regional um, context. And this can only be done if we better understand high-performance computing. And therefore, in the city of Guimarães, in Minho, in the north of Portugal, we, we brought together the five new petascales machine in Europe, which will provide a new high-performance computing landscape for science and innovation at an European context for the years to come. And this will be critical to be massified by scientists, but also by innovators, in a way that we can understand high-performance computing together with the greening of the computing um, um, infrastructures. Last but not least, the Porto Manifesto on the University and Culture have addressed European universities under the context of building an European corridor of culture by providing facilities to every single European university student to enter freely in museums around the university. Again, these nine different manifestos have been the result of six months of consecutive discussions through a series of conferences, which have also been framed uh, together with three major conclusions of the European Council. First, on research careers, because overall, we know that Europe needs more scientists, and to have more scientists, we need to have better research careers, and particularly better addressing the issue of accessing to careers by young researchers. We are not doing enoughly well, and we need to do better in terms of providing research careers in Europe. We have also addressed the issue of European universities, and in this context it's particularly important because CESAR brings leading university schools throughout um, um, Europe, that European university um, alliances should be test beds of best practices in recruiting and in providing learning systems which have a citizen-centered um, approach. Last but not least, under the Competitiveness Council for Space, we have approved um, by consensus um, a set of conclusions on promoting new space for people. Again, this set of conclusions, all of them shape different key technologies for the future, but always understanding that each technology has behind it and in its front friends a new knowledge base which needs to be enlarged and deepening through better research careers for researchers worldwide, in particular in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention and again I thank you very much Cesar and the Royal Academy of Engineering for organizing this event. Thank you. Minister Manuel Haitor, thank you very much for those inspirational words. We've come to the end of the conference now. Uh, thank you once again to everyone who participated, the speakers, the chairs, everyone who asked questions or got involved in the conversation online. It was a fascinating couple of days of discussion. So many topics felt we barely scratched the surface, but there's so much to discuss and so much to learn. Uh, a reminder that recordings of all these sessions uh, will be made available on the Royal Academy of Engineering website and also the website of CESAR. And we'll share viewing links with you after this conference um, is over and those links are ready. So you can go over all of the sessions 
pick up all the information that you might have missed the first time around or make sure that you follow up on the things you really need to follow up on. So it just remains for me to say thank you once again. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. But more importantly, a healthy, safe, energetic and educational next 30 years. Thank you very much and goodbye.